Hello and welcome to episode 5 of Roadkill Entertainment's Video Village Podcast. Today on the podcast, I'm going to have uh, my good buddy Mike Welch here with me. And he's, we're going to talk about like conventions and stuff like that. And we're going to talk about movies and all that. Mike's going to be a uh, co-host, like kind of on like every other episode that I'm not just rambling off to myself talking about nothing. But uh, yeah, okay, Mike, so introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. So, uh, Jay, you said this is episode five. It's like The Empire Strikes Back, which is the best of the... <laughs> oh, it uh, is. Wow, movies. that's funny. This is, yeah. So this will be the best Oh, wait, one that, that kind of plays into something, actually, because um, I, I had this re- random idea this afternoon. That I'm like, when I have somebody on the podcast for the first time, I'm going to ask them what their all-time favorite movie is. Okay, and the, I'm, I'm going to give the stipulations to the all-time favorite movie. <laughs> the stipulations are, it has to be a movie that you can watch at any time, it doesn't matter what you can put it in. If it's on TV, you feel you have to watch the whole movie from beginning to end, and you watch it at least once a year, if not more excessively than that. So, Mike Welch, what is your all-time favorite movie? Uh, my all-time favorite movie uh, would be a Clockwork Orange. Really? Yes. Okay, cool. That's interesting. I, you know, it's weird to say this, but I was I was kind of expecting a Star Wars movie, like cause, yeah, because because yeah. you're pretty like a Star Wars obsessed. So I was kind of expecting like the Star Wars movie, but Clockwork Orange, cool. That's yeah. awesome. I mean, you know, the Star Wars ones, they 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 bog down on picking a favorite because there's too many of them. Yeah, yeah so, it's kind so of like a whole it series. It's like kind of like you can say like I like the original three or something like that. Right. You know? Right. But yeah, for a single film, I mean, you know, and, and it's not qualified by a genre either. So if you're just taking every movie, then yeah, I pick clockwork. Cool. All right. Well, actually, I think I said it on the last podcast. Mine was Jaws. My, my all time favorite movie is Jaws. But I think that like, you can really, I don't know, you can kind of you, you can kind of tell a person's personality by what movie they say. <laughs> like yours kind of makes sense. Okay, Clockwork Orange that fits you. Like that that make I don't know why. I'm not saying it's weird and like you're a weird person, but like a Clockwork Orange kind of fits you. I, I can make sense. Okay, cool. Because I know you're a big Malcolm McDowell person, so right. that kind of plays into it as well. But um, but like if you're sitting around with somebody and they tell you that their favorite movie of all time is like a Serbian film, <laughs> then I shut the recorder off and I say, "Okay, program over. You could go home now." <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> but um, yeah. So all right. So let's try this. Um, have you seen anything over anything? Doesn't have to be. It can be new, old, whatever. Have you seen any movies lately that you'd like to talk about? Anything cool? Anything lately, man. But, uh, what the watching? past month or two or something like that <clears throat> that's a good question especially with the holidays just passed and you know i got movies and i know i watched it. you know what i saw for the first time what? last week i saw pretty in pink you I, never saw pretty i in have pink? never seen that movie before wow. i'm like man like john hughes is involved and i haven't seen it that's actually my favorite john well john hughes didn't direct that it's right. that guy howard deutscher deutscher yeah. deutscher whatever the hell yeah. his last name is um <laughs> Yeah, but that's actually, I think that's like my favorite, you know, John Hughes era movie is Pretty wow. in Pink. Some about, I mean, I love the classics too, like, you know, Breakfast Club and Sixteen Candles and yeah. Weird Science. Weird Science, oddly enough, though, I found as I get older, Weird Science doesn't hold up as well as it did when I was a kid. I don't know. What, do you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I, I thought that. And I also think of that of the, uh, of the Breakfast Club. And really? I, I think that's a factor of, of me getting older. I don't. I don't blame the movie. I blame me, and my sensibilities changing. And now I look at the the kids in detention, and I look at most of them, not all of them, but most of them. I go, well, yeah, you, you know, you deserve to be there. Yeah, you know? they kind of did. They <laughs> yeah. all did screw up. They did something. I mean, Christ, one kid they found a gun in his locker. Right. So I mean, nowadays that's like that's expulsion, yeah. like you know, like <laughs> criminal investigation territory. Yeah. And they wouldn't even put a, a a thing like that in a comedy anymore. No way. They wouldn't touch that at all. That's such a weird movie. Like when I look back on it, because like it doesn't adhere to now nowadays we're kind of used to with like modern movies nowadays adhering to genre everything adheres to a genre it's a horror movie it's a drama there aren't movies that cross genres as much right. anymore but that's an interesting movie because it crosses genres it's not really a comedy but it's it's also not really a drama right it's it, i mean i guess it's comedy drama or dramedy or whatever i think back in the day like when you used to get the tv guide <laughs> i think it actually used to say like comedy drama yeah like because you know how they used to have the little descriptions of yeah. what a movie was but they don't even really use that description anymore comedy no. drama but i used to see it in like the tv guide when i was a kid all the time comedy drama and, weird and that was john hughes niche right you know he made you love it 
because it was serious, but he made you love it because it was funny. Too. Well, right, because you just said you were talking about Pretty in Pink, all right? Well, how would you categorize that movie? That movie is a comedy drama, I guess. It's yeah. a, it's, it's a life movie. Like now they call it a romantic comedy. Do they? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, well, that would be considered a romantic comedy. Yeah. yeah, but it's I don't know. I I hate that I hate that so many and I, me and Katie have talked about this too. My wife Katie is. Um, I hate that so many great movies from the seventies and eighties have been lumped into the comedy, the the, the romantic comedy. Right. I mean, look at a movie like Annie Hall, which is a fucking classic seventies movie. Right. It's a romantic comedy now. Right. Which uh, which but, makes you not want to see it. Right. Most people like, and well, nowadays the two, like a younger generation, like I always say, like you know, younger guys growing up, like in their twenties right now, they're like, well, that's a romantic comedy. I'm not gonna watch that. But we grew up. When we grew up. A movie was a movie. It was a drama. It was a comedy. Even, actually, I, I almost gotta say, like, I don't remember the term romantic comedy when I was like 16, 17 years old. Yeah. I don't think that term even existed when we were growing up. Maybe it did, but like, it wasn't used widely to describe movies. Right. I don't think. But, um, yeah, so you liked Pretty in Pink. I did, you know, and, and, like, you know, for years and years, everybody, Ducky this, Ducky that. I'm like, what is this Ducky guy? But I have to admit, I have to tell you, until he got his heart broken and I could relate to him, I did not like Ducky. You didn't like All Ducky. that stuff in the beginning, I'm like, come on, dude, you just, you're trying too hard. Knock he was off. trying too hard to impress, yeah. Yeah. I and mean, that is the character. It's pretty obvious right. when you watch the movie. And I could relate to that, the trying too hard. I mean, I've certainly done that. Um, but just like the, you know, the, the mannerisms and the, like that I didn't relate to at all because I would be the, the quiet one yeah. who would try too hard and then just miserably fail. So yeah. So I, when he got his heart broken, I said, wow, now I like you. And I liked him for the rest of the movie, but yeah, going in, I'm like, who, why does everybody love this ducky guy? But then I found out. Yeah. You know what an older woman does for me? Changes your diapers. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny that you said pretty in pink because last night I was walking around the house. And I'm not even kidding you. I was walking around this living room like we were just done done watching something, and I just kept I was quoting pretty in pink to to my wife Katie, and she, I'm like and I'm like you know what I'm talking you know what I'm saying? She's like no. She's like looking at me. I'm like come on. I'm like you know this movie, and I just kept coming up with other ones. What was the other one that I was doing? I was doing Andrew Dice Clay. I was doing uh, I was doing I was doing wait. Let me see if I can do it. Um. Oh God, I remember the line. If uh, why do you come? <laughs> wait, wait. Oh, let me let me ask you something, honey. Why, if you know that that I that, that I'm not gonna let. Well, I had it last night perfectly, but like he said, it's something. It's the whole thing when he duckies outside the club and he's right. sitting outside with Daniel Dice Clay. So let me ask you something, honey. If you know that I won't let the duckster in, <laughs> or something like that, he's like, he's like, why do you keep coming here? And I just, I was saying stupid shit like that. I said, I don't know. It's probably not funny to anybody but me, but that's okay. <clears throat> it's, it's cool that they let him use his, his stage name too in that movie. Yeah, because he was Dice. Yeah, yeah that's and, the character he was playing. And I mean, nobody really knew who he was yet. That was early. That was yeah. pre like his his stage, which yeah. is funny. And like, because like I don't know, I grew up and I'm pre- same era. I mean, I'm 38 years old, and Mike, you're 38, I'm also right? 38. So, um, our era was 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 the Dice era. Like when we were in high school, that was like the thing, man. Everyone was fucking passing oh, around yeah. a tape of that HBO special. Oh, yeah. That was like the shit to have. Like back in that day, I remember actually even having. Um, I think they released it on like album or cassette or something like that as well. Cause I, I had a, a cassette copy off of, from somebody I, yeah. of the whole show, but it was the same H yeah. is the HBO like show. I found it on YouTube not that long ago and me and Katie sat through the whole thing again. And it was, it's, it's still pretty funny. Like it's actually, I mean, it's dated, right. like his humor is dated, which is interesting, but I, 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 I was laughing. I, it was still funny because it's so fucking blunt. Like the right. humor is so blunt. Right. Well, I mean, what were we like finishing eighth grade when that came out? I yeah. Think? Cause I just I going went, into high school. Like, yeah, I went during that summer. My mother took me to Brockton, which I don't, you know, most people won't know where that is, but it, it, she took me several towns over, maybe like a 25 minute drive, you know, whatever to a record store that had that. And also I got the anthrax home video on VHS. Um, Wait, which one was it? Uh, it was... Out of Nick of Fesson and Oh, nice wow. That, well, that's, that's an older one. Yeah, yeah that's, that, that was, was a hard one. That's... I remember the Killer Bees one that they put out. Yeah, there, came was out one, there was that a was VHS one of that. Um, but I went there. Well, I went there specifically for the Anthrax, but then I saw Dice there, and she let me get that too. And then she let me li- play it in the car on the way home in the cassette player. And I'm like, how is she going to relate to this one? <laughs> but, you know, she was a cool mom. She dug it. She was laughing. She was, was laughing she? at how outrageous he was. 
Well, because he's fun. I mean, it, yeah. I, my parents were kind of the same way. Like, they knew that I listened to it. And they, they I, I think they probably assumed that I didn't even really understand half of what he was saying. <laughs> like, they got the jokes more than I did probably yeah, back like, then. Yeah, like, yeah, what's a baloney pony? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. Like, yeah, this, it was just, it was his delivery that sold the jokes right. more than anything right. else. But um, let me see. Uh have I seen what did I see recently? Oh, I watched this movie last night actually, and um this is one actually I wanted to tell you about. It's called the The Way Way Back. I've heard uh, of Have you heard it, of that? that? Not, not yeah, we picked it, it up. Anymore. Actually, Katie kind of forced me to pick it up the other day because she wanted to see it, and I was just kind of well, okay, maybe I'll watch this movie. It's it's it was really good. It reminds me of a movie called Adventureland. If you've ever seen Adventureland, there's a movie called it's another yeah. movie, it's the same. It's one of these coming of age like comedy drama type things you know and it's all about this kid who um his mom is played by tony collette and his dad is steve carell oh stepdad is steve carell and he ends up going to it was all it was filmed in um in wareham oh and it the the whole movie takes place at Waterwiz, which is kind of cool actually um and uh sam rockwell is in it too and he plays like his this guy that he becomes friends with and he's kind of like this introverted quiet kid and the whole movie is like his summer in Massachusetts and him trying to like come to grips with the fact that his mom's with a guy that she doesn't really give a shit about. Like the Steve Carell character is kind of like, he's just not a good person. He's like cheating on her and stuff like that, which is an interesting role for Steve Carell to play yeah. because he usually doesn't play the bad guy. Yeah. He plays like the doofus, like idiot guy. You know what I mean? But no, the movie was a lot of fun and I, I, it was, well, not so much fun, but it was like, it was really pretty, like a heartfelt movie. Like, uh, like I'm not a, 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 like ashamed to admit that at the end of the movie, like it teared me up a little bit. Like wow. the movie was one of those movies that like kind of hit hit you where you know right where where it hurts. You know what I mean? And I was like, wow, this is. It was a well made movie. I, I don't know. I, I I think it's a movie that people should see. It's called The Way Way Back. Hmm. That was the name of it. And actually, I didn't know what the title was referring to. And apparently, I read a review online, and they said the title is a reference to the back of a station wagon because his dad, his stepdad, has this old station wagon that he restored, and he was sitting in the back seat. Remember this? Remember the remember, remember the gimp seat? Like the right, like right. if you were like the person that nobody fucking wanted in the family, <laughs> you sat in the back of the station wagon facing outward. <laughs> I always think it's funny because you're facing the oncoming traffic. <laughs> it's probably the worst design concept oh, ever yeah. because if there was an accident from behind right i, well, are, I guess it's no worse than being in the front but still no but that's i guess it was called that people used to refer to it as the way back seat like the way back that yeah. was like a term used to describe it so the movie's called the way way back but it because i don't know it's kind of a reference to the character because yeah. he's this quiet kind of sam rockwell's hilarious in it but what i said to katie when i was watching the movie sam rockwell was totally doing bill murray from uh meatballs Really? He was, that was the character he was playing because he ran the water whiz and he'd get the kid the job <laughs> and he was treating him like, like Bill Murray treats Christopher Makepeace and Meatballs. You know what I'm talking about, yeah. right? Oh, this is a really offshoot, but I said Christopher Makepeace and I just felt like saying this. Do you remember um, Kiss released an album in the 80s called The Elder? And I actually like The Elder. It's one of the last Kiss albums I really like. But this is the this is the most ballsy thing I've ever seen a band do. If you look at the album cover to The Elder... It says music from like the elder. It's supposed to be like a motion picture cover, and it says starring Christopher Makepeace really? on the album. Kiss was so fucking cocky back then that they were they were confident they were going to make a movie out of the album they recorded, and they wanted Christopher Makepeace to play the main role in the thing. So they wrote his name on the damn album jacket. Like if you look at the cover of the album, it says starring Christopher Makepeace. Like wow. that's ballsy. Yeah. They never even talked to the kid. I don't think about being in their movie. They're just like, ah, it's a Kiss movie. You're gonna be in our movie wow. gene's got his shit together you know yeah, yeah, that's, that's so gene. i don't know that was very ramble off of the christopher make peace thing but okay um all right well uh i don't i i think it kind of covers like what i've seen lately what uh, the other movie i watched was your next oh i'll i'll talk about your next i won't say too much about it because mike hasn't seen it yet i won't give away spoilers or anything but my opinion on your next i i i liked it i enjoyed the movie i'm, I'm not really sure why the horror community has been making such a big deal out of this movie. Like it's it's an entertaining film, but it's definitely it's a, it's Scream meets it's Scream meets The Strangers, with w- you kind of wish it had more Scream in it. Hmm. Does that make sense in a weird way? Like you kind of wish there was more elements of Scream in the movie because everyone talks about the humor in the movie. I've read tons of reviews about this movie about the humor. 
I watch the movie. It's pretty straightforward. Home and invade, home invasion flick. There's some humor here and there, but like the humor is in the situations, I guess. But because they're kind of absurd at times. Yeah. But they're not that absurd. They're nothing that unusual, really. It's gory. It's fun. I, I I would say don't go into the movie expecting it to be like this amazing new modern masterpiece, which is all over the DVD artwork. That's what it says. Innovative and, cre- and inventive. And I'm like, all right. Like maybe maybe it's innovative and inventive to like a 24-year-old guy, a person who's never, you know, who's just into horror movies now and hasn't really watched horror movies his whole life. But for people like us that have seen like everything under the sun, it's just, okay, it's another one. You well, know? You know, how come they've never made a vampire movie called Everything Under the Sun? That almost sounds like Cause, a given, cause, doesn't cause it? that's what they want to kill is everything under the <laughs> yeah, sun. Yeah, that almost sounds like it would be a given, doesn't it? <laughs> Okay, well, I guess um, I guess we'll we'll hop on to our topic now, since I've I've gotten all the the whatever out of the way. Okay, the topic this week, like I said before, this week, I'm not doing a <laughs> weekly show. I'm doing a bi monthly show now, so it's bi monthly. Once uh, uh, two episodes every month. The main ones will be on the first, and the me rambling and reviewing will be on around the fifteenth. But uh, the topic that we're going to do on this podcast, since I've got Mike here, and Mike's been like a volunteer he's gone to conventions like conventions are mike's thing mike is a convention guy so it's kind of fun to have somebody on here who has that many stories so i figure this is a good way to introduce mike so you know what mike i'm gonna just let you take it from here and you know explain your kind of history with like rock and shock and conventions and whatnot yeah i mean you know conventions are an amazing thing it's it's rock and shock every year in uh worcester massachusetts is uh is basically my Christmas every year. It's just you know, I, you know that's that's the kind of guy I am. Um, but 2005 was the first one I went to. Uh, 2004 was their first one, but I didn't you know I didn't even know that these things existed. Um, then I heard a, a commercial on the radio for the one in 2005. I said, "What is this? People are actually going to be there and signing autographs." So I decided to go, and I went by myself. And back then, I, you know, driving to Worcester to me was like driving to California. You know, I had, it was this totally other world, yeah. you know, because I didn't really travel or anything. Um, so I went to Worcester and the show, it, that year it was only a, a Saturday and Sunday show. Now it's Friday through Sunday. Um, but back then, Saturday morning, the show opened at maybe 11. Um, so I got there around 8 in the morning. I, you know, my mindset, again, I'd never done anything like this. So my mindset was there's going to be a giant line to get in and meet these people. Yeah. I have got to be there early. So, yeah, I showed up at 8 in the morning, and it was the first day of a 10-day, I believe, stretch of heavy rain in Massachusetts (laughs) that ended up flooding all kinds of places. That's nothing new. (laughs) Yeah. 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 (laughs) So, So it was a long wait. And I got there and I said, wow, it's really pouring. I'm going to get soaking for three hours. What am I doing? But I was like, well, I went and checked it out. And luckily there was also at the DCU Center a firefighters conference or something. So the doors were open and I was allowed to go in. I could just wait in the lobby. So they had a, they had multiple conventions running at the same time that first yeah. year. Because yeah. they don't usually do that. It's pretty much just rock and shock now. There's not anything else going on. Walt. Yeah, I mean, they like the firefighter thing was only in a, a couple small rooms yeah. in a different floor. Mm. Um, but yeah, they it is mostly now just rock and shock. They've taken over a lot of rooms and whatnot. Mm. Um, but yeah, so I got to wait in the lobby, and there were there were two older gentlemen who were working, you know, security, I guess, um, and they let me stay in the lobby because you know they knew it was raining they took pity on my poor ass that was there so early and i even when i got there they're like you know the show doesn't start for many hours i said yeah i know i thought there'd be a lot of people here <laughs> so i stood there for hours waiting <laughs> and then people showed up and you know i i clearly had no idea what i was doing so you're the only but person there that i was at that point in time for a couple the hours first yeah. person there i was the yeah. first person there for a couple hours <laughs> that's great <laughs> um but then we lined up and I was kind of mad because I wasn't first in line. I was like, oh, I earned the spot, but whatever. I didn't know what I was doing anyway. But luckily, I fell in line behind some guys who had been there the previous year. And they were just talking about their game plan. And I listened to them because I went because I wanted to meet Bill Mosley and Sid Haig uh, and Ashley Lawrence from Hellraiser. 
those are my three big ones. Those were the first year? That, well, the yeah. second year. The that was se- the yeah, year second year for them. Um, but George Romero was going to be there, too. And how stupid was I not to want to go meet him first? But I learned from those guys how big of a line he would have. So I say, oh, what, you, what these guys are saying makes sense. So I just followed them once we were let in over to Romero's. And I was glad because I was like fifth in line. And then his line just exploded because he was, you know, he's George Romero. Yeah, right. Um, so I did that and I got up to Romero and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so I picked a picture at the table. I met him. I have no idea what to say to him. And he looks at my picture, which was a behind the scenes shot of him directing. And he goes, where do people get? these pictures and i'm so stupid i went i just got it from your table i i didn't know what he, I didn't, <laughs> yeah, I had no yeah. idea what he was talking about and he and he looks and he goes no not that i mean where how do people take these pictures i don't even know that this existed i i, I, I don't know and i just got my autograph and left uh, i get this up oh, i'm failing already <laughs> so yeah. so i stopped at ashley lawrence next and i have a pinhead tattoo on my forearm so I shook her hand. She was really nice. And first off, she says, where have we, where have we met before? I was like, um, we haven't. I, I've never been to one of these shows. She goes, I know we've met before. Um, no, and now I'm getting a little scared. Because <laughs> um, she's really a deep person, you know, but, but I, you know, I was taken aback because I'd never done this. And she's like, no, well, and I'm like, no, I've never been to one of these. And she's like, oh, it must be. It must be your heritage. Are you Irish? Uh, yeah, because you know I had a big red beard, and she goes, "Okay, it must be must be your heritage. I can I can sense it." I go, okay. <laughs> okay then. <laughs> and then she saw my pinhead tattoo and she started rubbing my arm, I'm like this is kind of all right, but I'm a little scared too. Did she take you in the back? <laughs> I mean, it, it was great. But uh, but you know I talked to her a little bit and she was cool. It was so it was a little weird but really awesome. And I said, "Okay, I'm like kind of fifty fifty right now." And then I went to Bill and Sid were sitting next to each other. And I saw Sid first. And I had the same Devil's Rejects t-shirt that he had. So I was like, hey, man, cool shirt. I'm just trying to be <laughs> stupid, whatever. And he looked at his, his girlfriend, soon to be his wife. And he said, oh, he got the t-shirt memo. And he's really gruff. And he's just like you think he is. He is just like his character. I've seen him in person, but I've never actually met him or talked to him. I've heard him talk. But... Yeah. Yeah. He's, you know, he's cool. And he's, but he's also take no shit. Um, so, you know, we like, oh, okay, cool. And I, I bought a picture and he signed it. And, uh. And by this time, I had a Romero picture. I had an Ashley Lawrence picture. I had an Ashley Lawrence piece of artwork, which was like double the size of an 8x10. And I have nothing to put it in. I didn't bring anything because, uh, you know, never done it before. Yeah, you weren't prepared. And now I got SIDS, and I know I'm going to get a bunch of other ones. I'm like, man. SID had messenger bags from the Devil's Rejects. Which is really freaking random that he it just is. happened to have bags. And that's where you got the bag, the which, bag which that I you still always... Use to this day. You had it like every shoot we filmed. Yeah. Like, of, yeah. Like, you better watch out. Yeah. I use it all the time at shows. It's my show bag. Um, so he had them and he had lunch boxes. He had... If Devil's Rejects merchandised it, he had it at his table to sell. Wow. So yeah, he was big into that. So I was like, wow, Smart. I'm saved. Yeah. <laughs> so I bought a messenger bag, came in a plastic bag. He's like, oh, do you want me to open this? Uh, do you want me to sign this? Yeah. So he opened it, put the bag down. I got my bag. It was great. And then I'm like, well, I don't want to leave trash at his table. So I pick up the plastic bag that had come in. It had tape on it. The tape was stuck to the lunch boxes, which were metal. It starts pulling the... No. And it was a tower. It wasn't just a row. It was a tower of... Man. lunch boxes this starts pulling on them and you can hear the metal scraping and the thing wobbling i said oh god i'm gonna knock this over but i didn't wow. luckily yeah but sid looked at me like he was gonna murder me there's those lunch boxes too because of all things they're just such cheap metal yeah if they would have fell to the floor you would have dented like three or four of those yeah. lunch boxes oh yeah. yeah easily so yeah i i pulled the tape off and i took the bag and i, I apologized to him I'm sorry and i'm like man i am not doing well with this at all <laughs> um, but Bill Mosley saved me. I wa- I got into his line, and he met me with a handshake, stuck his hand out, and he said, "Hi, what's your name?" Wow. Like I was the important one. That's pretty cool that he does that. Actually, yeah. he, I met him too, and he's awesome. He's yeah. he's really forthcoming with you. Like you don't feel uncomfortable when you walk up to him because he, like you said, he makes you know he makes you want to talk to him. Kind of like you're like, okay, gets the awkwardness out of yeah. the way. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Um, and it was it was great. 
And because of that, I have not missed meeting Bill at any show I've ever been to. If he's there, I get something from him. He's here almost every single year for Rock and Shock. He is. I think was it was like one year he wasn't there, but like he wasn't here this past year because he was vacationing. Yeah, that was it. In Mexico, but he would would have been there if he wasn't on vacation, probably. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, and he all these years later, he still gets a great line because he's a nice guy. Yeah. Have you ever uh, heard any of his music? Like I've not. Oh I, yeah, I have all this. Is is, is oh, it is yeah. it pretty good? I've never Corn, actually heard any of it. Like um, yeah, Cornbugs. Um, it's him Corn on bugs, vocals. Yeah. Uh, Buckethead on guitar and Buckethead's. Just oh, great. Buckethead, really? Yeah, I didn't yeah. know Buckethead was. Oh wow, yeah. cool. And uh, and the drummer's name is Pinchface. So. <laughs> um, but it's really weird stuff. It's 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 kind of folky at times. It's kind of metal at times. You know, it's. It's like stuff that they, they, you know, they demoed and, you know, they just had fun with it. That's cool. I and, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. I like crazy off the wall kind of. Would you, would you kind of put it like in like almost like a weenish category in a sense? I get a little heavier than that. Heavier than ween. Yeah. Okay. okay. <clears throat> yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool stuff. It's, it's fun. Um, and they sing about horror movies and things like oh, yeah, that. Cool. And, oh. Yeah. It's, it's really cool. That's cool. Yeah. Um, so after that, yeah. it got better. <laughs> you know, yeah, like I, that that reset my confidence, and, and I was cool after that. Yeah. And that was your first year at Rock and Shock. Yeah, the first year. Yep. Now, how did you get involved with Rock and Shock? Like, how long did it take for that to happen? Uh, it took a few years. Um, yeah. I went that year, and then I, I was hooked because I had so much fun. Even after that bad, you know, the the rough start, I got much better at it. Um, so I went the next couple years. And actually, my my friend Tim had started coming along with me, um, and I think after the third year, say, oh, 2008 was the first year I volunteered. So what happened was in 2007, I met the woman who runs the show at a convention in Indianapolis. Okay. And uh, again, Bill Mosley. Um, I had just got my Devil's Rejects tattoo, and I wanted to show them with the guys, and I showed it to him. And I said, Bill, are you going to be a Rock and Shock this year? And he's like, Well, I don't know yet because this was Mar. No, this was July, and the show's not till October. Right. So he's like, I don't know yet, but there's the woman that runs the show. Go talk to her. And Gina, right? Gina. Yeah, M- Gina. Uh, Mig- what, how do you pronounce Mig- that? Migliosi. Migliosi. Okay. Yeah. Um, so she was sitting uh, with Joe Netter. Uh, he's a writer. He's an author, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I I went over and and introduced myself. Said, you know, hey, I'm I'm from Massachusetts too, and you know, I really love your show, et cetera. So, you know, we, we talked for a little bit about the show and, you know, and it was it was cool to, to see her there and meet her. And then when when Rock and Shock rolled around that year, 2007, um, I saw her walking around and I said, hi, you probably don't remember me, but... And she's like, oh, of course I remember you. And she said from where, so she legitimately remembered oh, wow. me. I said, wow, that's really cool. Yeah, that is cool. You know, because I didn't have a gigantic beard that everybody remembers me for at the time. It was just a regular beard. It was just kind of you like, know? yeah, it wasn't... Yeah. No. So, yeah, so it meant more than to be remembered. Um, so that was really cool. And we hit it off and we became friends after that, you know, legit regular friends. Um, so early the next year, I, Tim and I talked about it and he's like, why don't you, um, you know, why don't you talk to Gina and, and tell her we'll help her out, you know, setting up or something before the show. So you offered up the volunteer. That's well, yeah. how, okay. So it wasn't like she asked you if, cause I was curious how that yeah, actually happened. I mean, the, the whole volunteer thing is, is pretty much like a, like a family thing. Like, you know, if, you know, if you're like, I can bring in people that I know yeah. because I'm trusted enough now, but it's not just like a, Hey, you kind of walk in off the street thing, you know, like you gotta, you know, you gotta talk to people and you know, what happened, right. you, you, you know, we don't, cause you know, there's a lot of trust in being yeah. a volunteer. Yeah. So, right. you know, it, it's a very family kind of show. So you got to know who's, you know, you, you got to be able to vouch for your volunteers. Hopefully maybe like one of these years I'll, I, I, I'm, it, I just want to have the experience of it actually It would be nice. It. It's, it's much more Maybe even fun. this year if we don't have a movie, because we probably won't have a movie in it. Maybe yeah. I, I just, I just want to try. I just want to like have that experience, be there all weekend and it's work. It's great. It, you know? it, it's, it's amazing. Um, yeah. And she, she put us, she put us to work. Well, she said, you know, yeah, you can volunteer. Absolutely. So I started giving flyers out, doing the street team thing. Uh, that was like the early part. And then, you know, our intention of volunteering, Tim and I, would be, you know, we assumed it meant that we would go help set up stuff before the show. And then when the show started, we'd just go and do our thing. Right. Um, apparently, that was not what volunteering was. <laughs> yeah. And we didn't know. So we, uh, 
we got there early on the Friday and, you know, we helped set up and we hung flyers. We did whatever they wanted. And we actually had like a two hour stretch where there was nothing to do. So we sat there and we were kind of forgotten about. Uh, so we just like kind of went back over, you know, to the to the venue um, and we're like, anything to do? And they're like, well, no. Uh, and then uh, Nikki, Gina's sister, is actually the head of the volunteers. And Gina said, well, that's, you know, that's Nikki. Um, I'll go introduce you. She's the head of the volunteers. Uh, she can tell you what, you know, what your, the plans are for the, the night. And me and Tim looked at each other and we said, uh, what? What? <laughs> we're, we're, we're still working? The sh- I didn't, there's more to do? <laughs> um, so, yeah, we, we got roped in. Not roped in. We had volunteered. We, right. just, we just didn't understand. You just didn't understand the parameters yeah. of it. So Nikki gave us the rundown, and she's like, all right, you'll be sitting with a celebrity, and you do this and that. And we're like, but I, I wanted to go have fun and meet people. <laughs> what's, what's going on? But, you know, but Gene is a friend, and friends come first, so I, I wasn't going to say no. Right, of course. You know? Um, so, so Tim and I were treated as one volunteer, because at the time, if you had, like, five volunteers, that's all you needed. Nowadays, the way the show is... yeah. You like I, this past October I brought I was personally responsible for 19 people that I wow, brought to the show. That's nuts. And that wasn't enough. Because, yeah, you guys were running around like lunatics. Yeah, when, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> like Nikki brought people. Like the show, the conventions are big business now. But you know, back then when we started, we had like five volunteers, and that was too many. Right. You know. So now with the with the um, this is the Worcester Centrum still, right? The yeah, back, the, yeah it's the been DCU. at the same place with yeah. the DCE Center. Yeah. Now would it. Even back then, would it fill up in there like it does now, like no. during the day? It didn't. No, no. And, I mean it was it was heavily trafficked, but they didn't have the same amount of space. Like every year, they kept taking down a partition by partition and getting a bigger space in the hall. Yeah, you know because they can they can divide it however they yeah. want. But yeah, so they kept the show kept expanding huh. every year. And the uh, film festival part of it, that's new, right? That's not yeah. because that's um we've been we've been involved in the film festival for like the past two years now, but like I that that wasn't there at the at the beginning, right? No, it it they used to just show movies from the celebrities who were gonna be at the show. Ah. Okay. Like, you know, my first the first year I went I saw I watched Reanimator on D V D. Right. But they didn't do anything with original films or anything like that. Huh. Now now it's you know, now it's a big deal. You know, you get your credentials and everything now. Which you know we've been lucky to be. A Which part is pretty of. cool, actually. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> they have you get your festival wings. You yeah, know? so it's a, it's amazing how the the whole convention industry has grown, and you know, and there's good and bad to that, which we can get to in, in a bit. Yeah, um, <clears throat> definitely. But yeah, so so Tim and I were treated as one celebrity that we could keep changing back and forth and sitting with the one guest, um, and it it ended up being that they needed an extra person, so we were split up. So I I was put with Chris Sarandon, uh, voice of Jack Skellington, and you know Princess Bride and Fright Night. Fright Night, yeah, which is my favorite Chris Sarandon role. Yes. Um, Tim actually ended up at the table next to me, and he was he was with Michael Bean. Ah, huh, cool. And next to Michael Bean was his girlfriend Jennifer Blank. So he was between the two of them, and he didn't have a fun weekend, and I did. Really? So, so wait. So Michael Bean wasn't just not. Um, I'm on a break. I met Michael Bean, and he was one of my least favorite people to ever meet at a really? show. For anyone who doesn't know, Michael Bean uh, played uh, Kyle. Uh, uh, Kyle, what? Roos? Rose? Roos is in the Terminator. Yeah, he's the, the like the main character of the Terminator, aside from like Linda Hamilton and right, and, and, Arnold, and, yeah. and Arnold. Plus, he was also in um, what? The, he's been in a ton of shit. Michael he Bean. Was in he's in Aliens. In, he was an aliens, duh. Yeah, no yeah. shit. There you go. Yeah. So, but um, yeah, he uh, yeah, I I was so bummed out by his his uh, Reese. Sorry, Kyle Reese. Yes, yes. <laughs> that was bugging me. <laughs> go ahead. Sorry. Um, his his his. I just want to. Say, I might as well just say bad attitude. Yeah. Um, he was not fan friendly, and I was so bummed out. I didn't even want to take a picture with him. Really? Yeah, and you know, and that's one of the things you do at the shows is you take you take a picture with the person. That's right. And you are deal. like convention picture man. Like yeah. you get a picture with everybody yeah. you meet. Yeah, yeah definitely. Of course. So. Um, so yeah, I was really bummed out about that situation. He was just just so dry and didn't want to answer questions. And you it know. just seemed like he didn't really want to be there. Right. That's exactly. what it basically seemed like. Yeah. Um, and then, so Tim working between the two of them, 
you know, when they would bicker, he was right between the two of them. And he had to kind of work her table, too, because, you know, she was a, an attractive female who didn't have somebody at her with her table. Now, Jennifer, and, Bl- Jennifer Blank, is that what you said her name was? Wait. Yeah, did I, did I get it wrong? Yeah, his, his wife. Who's, oh, oh, but she, but she was also, what, else, what was she in? I, I remember the name doesn't sound familiar to me. She was in, she's in a lot of stuff he's in. Really? Yeah, she was in oh. Dark Angel. That was her claim to fame at the time. Was oh wait dark oh dark angel um yeah. I come in peace that movie yeah 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 oh, no 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 not no the not movie. not the the, the, the Dolph show. Lundgren one the, the TV, TV show, show. okay yeah. okay yeah, that's yeah. that's what her claim to fame was okay. yeah um and you know she was nice you know it, it's just that Tim was in a rough spot because um, you know that I guess they were they were arguing a lot that weekend <laughs> so I felt bad for him but I would look over and watch and I'm having fun because Chris Sarandon he was dry at first but he he turned out to be great yeah um he was reading he was reading a book to me when it was slow on Sunday morning just because he didn't want to exclude me and be that guy who's just sitting there reading. Well, that's nice. That's cool. (laughs) He shared his newspaper with me. Like he was, he was really cool, you know, talk, talking about like football and all this. And, you know, we we were talking about all kinds of stuff. And then I'd look over at Tim and Tim was just miserable. Who else was there that year? Do you remember? Um, Aside from the obvious, because I would imagine like Bill Mosley was probably there, and like, <laughs> I don't know if Sid Haig was there again that year, but he's usually, been on and off like every other year. Yeah, kind of. yeah, he's he's usually there with Mosley, but Mosley's Mosley's always there when when yeah. Sid's not, but Sid's usually there too. Who was um, the big draw of the week of the of that year? It was it was kind of a wacky year. Um, I know that Jason Mewes, that was his first time there. That was the first time they. They kind of got, you know, I mean, granted, he has horror credits, but he was more clerks. Yeah. So they, they, they went with that. Like him and Brian O'Halloran were there. They were both there that year? Okay. Yeah. And uh, Corey Haim was another ah, big one, okay. which, you know, I, I don't know. I wasn't, I'm not a fan of, of his, um, you know, he seemed to, I you know, I, I saw him making faces of people behind their backs and they were fans. When he struggled with drugs and alcohol right up he, to his he did. death, really. Yeah, think, he did, right? and you know, and I, I appreciate that you know he got clean and all that, but he just didn't seem to be very appreciative of the people who, yeah. he, you know, he, you know, once you see him making faces of people, it's come on, man. He's kind of like, well, I mean, I guess the convention scene has changed over the years too, but like, I can see him kind of as like that group of actors that. You know, that's when they started doing the convention scene, in a sense. So they, they weren't they, they weren't as appreciative of the fans and the people. It was almost like a job. It was almost like, okay, here comes another one. Yeah, like, you know yeah, what I mean? I could see that. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of speculating. But, it, I mean, it, it, it seems like people have gotten used to it now, and it's become a thing. Right. But go back a good, you know, five, six, seven years ago, and it wasn't as big of a deal at that point. No, yeah, that's true. It, and it wasn't at that point still. Yeah, you're right. Maybe I don't know, but that doesn't make that doesn't excuse it, him making fun of the fans right, coming up to right. his desk. Yeah, that uh, yeah. doesn't make it okay. But uh, you know, so that yeah, I you know I wasn't. Did into you meet Jay Muse that year? Did you get to meet no. Jay Muse? No. no, I you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, I did, I met Brian O'Halloran. Um, Jay Muse, I had to guard his table while he was out for his his uh, smoke break. There were a lot of those. Um, so I, it was on Sunday, so I was standing in front of his table, for some reason I couldn't stand behind it, uh, telling everybody in line who, you know, were very, you know, some of them were really cool and some of them were very, you know, Jay-like, um, you know, that he'd be back and whatever. And then it's, when Jay came back, I was, I was just like, are you good? Okay, I'm out of here. Cause, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm, I guess I'm not a big Jay Muse fan either. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. Not, like, well, like, like I'm sh- like enjoy the movies, but as a as a right. person, like you're right. just not right outside of it. Which was funny because I, I I I spent a little time with him this past year in part of like a group thing when we were planning out strategy for the show, and and he, you can tell he's in a much better place. Oh, he's now. he's a lot better now. Like yeah. he's like apparently clean now. Yeah, he was a big time like drug user. It was heroin and shit like yeah. that. He was he- yeah. I mean, and at that know, point when you would have met him that year. That was during his like on and off, off and on, on and off again, like heavy drug period. Yeah, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was rough. So, you know, but, but I had fun with him this past year, you know, the interactions, you know, he, he seems like a much better, like I would rather meet this version of Jay, of Jay yeah. than the old Jay. Right. Um, so yeah, at the time I wasn't digging it, I, you know, because I was 
digging, sitting with Chris Sarandon. It was great. Yeah, that's awesome. The only like it was funny because they had a Hellraiser reunion that year, and I really wanted to see the Q and A, and and you know, and I could have gotten the time off to go see that if I could. Yeah. And I, you know, as bummed as I was about not getting to go out and have fun, I didn't go ask to take a break to go watch the Hellraiser Q and A because I had. I I immersed myself in this new world of yeah. volunteering. So something well, that you I, were new to it too. It was like, well, this is like your first year volunteering. Yeah. So I would have felt a little awkward asking for time. I mean, true, you know, true. To, and you know, and I didn't want to let Gina down, and that that was most important. Um, but I came to love it in a very short amount of time, and that's probably because I had a good person to sit with. Yeah. If I had been in Tim's place with Michael Bean upside, I'm never doing this again. Maybe, like, yeah, I was just thinking the same thing. If, like, the first year you would have had an awful, like, actor to sit with that just gave you shit all day, like, right. you probably would have never done it again. You probably right. would have just went as a fan to the conventions, maybe, yeah. if yeah. you felt like it. You know, yeah, because, I mean, like, doing the flyers and street team stuff, that's cool because it's way before the show. But, yeah, but I, I'm glad it all worked out really well. Um and that parlayed into the, the next year where we went back to be volunteers again. Um, and, you know, Nikki had a real, you know, a real appreciation for the work we had done the year before. Because and we, Nikki is her, as Jean is like a, like head assistant, like her, her like right hand yeah. person. Yeah, it's her, it's her sister. And, okay. You know, and yeah, it's her, she's the head of volunteers. She oh, okay. does, she does a boatload of work. Um, so yeah, the the next year came and we said yeah we'll volunteer again and even Tim was up for it because he's like oh can't be you know <laughs> yeah why not right? yeah and I mean you know he he looked at it in hindsight and said it wasn't that bad so that that was good well and he he probably figured too he'd get somebody different this year so, yeah yeah exactly so it's it's a different experience you it's know? it's a crapshoot every year yeah. as, as I would experience <laughs> uh, so that year the headliners were John Landis and Malcolm McDowell that's and, cool yeah and my uh, my favorite actor is Malcolm McDowell. So we got to the show, and I was in rough shape because I had, I had hurt my knee, and I could barely walk. Like, we got, we got in the parking garage, and I had to go down a few flights of steps, and I said, I, am not, I don't know how I'm going to get through this weekend. <laughs> but, like, two hours later, I'm walking fine. That's, like, that's the energy of the show. That's it's how the much adrenaline it. kicked it, in. It fixed you know? me, yes. Yeah. It cured me. The it's like when a mother me. sees their child <laughs> yes, <laughs> hit, yeah, yeah. getting ready to get hit by a car. She jumps <laughs> out, lifts the car up, you know? But, yeah. so, uh, so we were doing flyers, Tim and I, and we were walking between venues because they also have music at the, uh, a block away at the Palladium, which uh, Gina runs that too. So we were walking between, hanging up flyers, and uh, Tim said, so tell me, out of all these people, who would you want to work for? And I said, well, Malcolm McDowell. I said, you know, what about you? And he's like, oh, John Landis would be great. And I was like, okay, well, it's our second year here. We're not getting those guys. You know, no way. Like, there's a hierarchy. Right. we got to climb up the ladder. Um, so we had our volunteer meeting, and we saw Nikki, and Nikki said, all right, well, I need somebody really dependable for Malcolm McDowell and John Landis. And she looked at both of us, and she said, I want you two to pick between those two. Oh, wow. Because cause we didn't take breaks. We didn't mess with the money you know money was spot on you right. know all that i mean nobody's really messes with the money but right. you know but we were we were good at it yeah. you know we had a passion for volunteering i guess and she appreciated that that you know we didn't ask her for anything or you know we were Probably a level of professionalism like you treated it like a job like a level right. of, like you weren't just like there's some goofball which i'm sure i'm sure you've had incidents like that yeah the yeah you people can't, that don't you, treat it right yeah you can't be a fanboy at all when you do this and and Obviously, I picked Malcolm McDowell, and he's my favorite actor. He must have been like sweating bullets all right before, it, right? We would get kind oh, of weirded out by it. It, it. it was great. Yeah, I was. <laughs> At first. Until I was. You, yeah. Inside, right. Yeah. Inside, I was, I was going crazy. But yeah, but I, I'm, I have to be professional because at the end, I'm doing this for Gina. I'm doing this for the show that I love. I have the Rock and Shock logo tattooed mm -hmm. on my arm. That's how much I love the show. So, yeah, I get Malcolm McDowell. I'm flipping out. So, uh, you know, the show starts and I, and I meet him and he's, you know, really nice. And he's like, hi, how you doing? And the first Friday night volley goes through. And Friday's kind of slow, you know, because uh, it's only at night. And then Saturday's the big day and Sunday's a little slow too. So the first, the first wave goes through on Friday night. And then we have a little bit of a lull. And at the first lull, uh, Malcolm looks at me and he goes, 
you know, because I'm heavily tattooed and uh, and I have a big burly beard and whatnot. And he looks at me and he says, do you scare young virgin girls? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I can hear his voice yes. as you say that. Yes. Like that, that Malcolm McDowell. <laughs> <laughs> now, if anybody else said this to me, I'd be pretty pissed off. Like, you know, who the hell do you think you are? <laughs> But it's McDowell talking, yeah. so i like, all right, i got to be on with this one. So I looked at him, and I said, yeah, and some not-so-virgin ones, too. And he clapped me on the back and laughed, and we were we were tight as buds for the rest of the he weekend. He was feeling you out. Yeah, like, he, he was. He, he was seeing, like, can I be myself with this guy, yeah. or is this going to be, like, uncomfortable? Yeah, he was totally testing me, and, and I passed. And I would I would make him laugh a few times through the weekend, because he, he's, you know, he's got that British... You know, that humor, that yeah. that very sarcastic, very smart way of uh, talking to people. And if you were if you were being a little too much of a fanboy, he'd sass you. Yeah. And, you know, and so sometimes I could do it, too. Yeah. It was so great. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I was that. I had to, like, be kind of bodyguardish for him at one time. Some crazy dude was there, and, and he's looks at me, and he's like, oh, what are you, his bodyguard? I'm like, I'm whatever he needs. And then... Like the other people working his table came over and was like, "Oh, that was good that you were there." I'm like, "Well, where were you?" But anyway, but yeah, I had a I had a real fun time working for him. Uh, he was really cool, really funny, told great stories. Uh, so I said, "Well, it can't get any better than this, can it?" So the next year came, and I worked uh, I worked for Julian Sands. And this was, do you remember what year this was? Now, uh, this is, so uh, this would be 2009. This would be 2010. This was actually this was my first year when I this is the first year I went I didn't know you at the time yeah. but this is the year that was it the was it the David Hess year uh, I believe so Romero headlined yeah and yeah David Hess was yes David Hess was there this was David yes. Hess yeah because the next year he passed and yes. then they had the th- they they dedicated it to him yeah okay so yeah so the, okay go ahead <laughs> yeah um, so yeah so I worked for Julian Sands and uh, we got along. And I like Julian Sands, but we had a rough start. Of Warlock fame for any of you 80s. Yeah, Warlock fame. Horror fans. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I got picked by Julian's agent because he was also Malcolm's agent the year before, and he he liked the work that that I did. So he kind of stole me for for Julian, which I, I was honored that that he would appreciate my work enough to remember me and pick me and, yeah and i, I still see him at shows now and talk to him i, I love him to death he's the, his agent he's really he's a really cool guy um so he picked me for julian and julian i found out had just taken like an 18 hour flight or some crazy thing because they were filming girl with the dragon tattoo in east wherever i don't know you know he oh he's in the he's in the uh the swedish versions I no didn't... no he's in the american version oh he is yes wait julian sands is in that i, I don't yeah. remember him being there yeah wow funny um but he was like just finishing filming that oh, okay and and flying straight to the show oh wow so he was really tired and okay that you know that's cool so i'm customarily what i do if i'm when i'm at the table before the guest gets there and I stand until the guest arrives and the guest is ready to go. I feel it's respectable right. to not just be sitting there. You that know? makes sense. Um, so, you know, I respect the guest. I respect the show. So he shows up and I meet him. I shake his hand. Everything's cool. He starts walking around saying hi to some of the people he knows. And that's cool. And I'm still standing because he hasn't really gotten to work yet. So when he gets to work, he stands. So both of us are standing. I'm like, ah, oh, what am I doing? So finally, you know, I sit down. Um, and I guess he didn't really dig that too much because Saturday morning I went back to work for him. And the first thing he says to me is, okay, now I want you to sit down all day because I don't want anyone confused as to who the guest is. Uh-huh. And, I, I, you know, and to me, I looked at the pictures, and, you know, I was like 250 pounds, and he's, you know, a good-looking guy that all the girls loved and stuff. I, and I was, in my head, I'm saying, there's nobody that's going to think I'm you. <laughs> yeah. I said, but you are the guest. I'm working for you. Yeah, right. Whatever you say, sir. Um, so we got that out of the way, and I was a little, you know, put off by it, but... 
we ended up getting along after that, and by Sunday we were we were making fun of people, and you know, because <laughs> it happens, we had a we had a contest to see if he could get like twenty autographs, twenty paid autographs that day, because everybody was coming up wanting free things. Really? Yes. That people, you know, people just don't understand. You got to pay for this stuff because these guests, for the most part, are not getting paid to appear. Now, people wanted like free stuff from his table, like his pictures and they, stuff, or just they, or just pictures. They wanted they're... to take a picture with him. Yeah. Or just say hi. Yeah. You know, and if you get a hundred flash bulbs in your eyes in a day, you're not going to like it. No. So to give all this away for free, you know, when you could be filming, you could be with your family. You're not getting paid to be there. The autograph money you make is your livelihood for that weekend. You know, the fans need to understand that aspect. Yeah, I don't think that's interesting because I don't think a lot of people look at it that way, which, I mean, now I do because I've kind of been around it a little bit and I've talked to you a lot about yeah. it and, and, and through knowing David Hess and knowing how he handled it and stuff, he, people don't realize that, like, you know, this is their money for the weekend. This right. is this is their job for the weekend, you right. know? Yeah, they, they I think people their- assume they're, that a lot of... I know some of the bigger ones get paid more money to be there, but but I think people assume in general that everyone who's there is getting paid like big money, and it's that's not the case. Right, and that's not the case at all. They get their they get their flight paid for and their hotel paid for, um, and you know the the money they make off the autographs is what they're living on for the weekend. And, you know, and you know if you're if you're like a John Landis, maybe you don't really need that money to survive, but still he's he made the effort to come here. Right. He's working, you know. You know, and it is work. I mean, because they're sitting there all weekend long behind is. a desk signing and talking to people. I mean, they don't have a life for an entire weekend. Right. And, you know, and you have to realize that that being on all weekend, you know, it takes a lot of energy, you know, there and, you know, and, and you might you might ask them a question and it might be the greatest question in the world, but they get that question over and over and over. I kind of equate it to like, I always feel like. Like if you're in, if you're hanging out with like, say like certain people that you know, like, you know, not that you're close, close friends, but people that you just know in general and like everyone's talking to each other and everything. And, you know, people are telling jokes and you're doing that kind of fake joke laugh. Do you know what I'm talking yeah. about? Like yeah. after about two hours of just kind of, <laughs> it's exhausting. After about two hours of that, you're like, <sighs> yeah, it is. you just don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, and I mean, every, you know, they're appreciative that the fans are there, obviously, you know, but, but how like, many yeah. times can you tell the same story? Like, right. And say the same stuff. Right. You know, and you know, and none of the guests want to disappoint any of the fans, you know, but they're, they're definitely working. You yeah. know, it's, you know, it's now, did you get to meet John Landis that year? I did. <clears throat> I did the first he night. He seems like a cool guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was funny cause he kept coming over to Malcolm's table all weekend too. Cause he was trying to get him to be in Burke and Hare. Oh, and okay. He was like, yeah. you know, they went to dinner and whatnot. And yeah, he, so he kept talking to him all weekend. But the first night, Malcolm left like, you know, <clears throat> half an hour early or something. So I, I went over to Landis because I, I brought my Muppets Take Manhattan. I wanted him to sign my... That's that, awesome. Yeah. 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 Um, I, you know, I turned out to be the only one that weekend because Tim got, you know, Tim was there. I'm like, did anybody else bring Muppets Take Manhattan? He's like, no, just you, you loser. That's pretty rare. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I got to meet him and he was really funny. I asked him... Uh, um, I asked him if there were any other fake billboards in uh, in American Werewolf in London besides the See You Next Tuesday, like the obvious ones, maybe something you never <laughs> yeah. noticed. Yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah, he said no. Um, but yeah, I gave him the Muppets one, and he's like, "Man, nobody ever brings this one for me to sign." <laughs> <laughs> um, apparently, he, t- he told a story about how um, Cheech Marin made one of his kids cry during the premiere of Muppets Take Manhattan. Really? Because the because his, his kid, I think it was his son was like oh kermit blah, blah, blah. is that max it, like his son max like he's, I, I don't know because he's a he's like a filmmaker now himself like he makes he, i think he directed oh, one of the masters right. of horror episodes. he did have, yeah masters of horror um we worked with his dad on the masters of horror yeah episode. yeah he like directed and oh he wrote it and like something yeah it, yeah um so yeah, Cheech heard him go, Kermit, whatever, and he turned around and, and he's like, Don't you know it's a puppet kid or something? <laughs> I'm like, Wow, Cheech, come on. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Landis was really cool. He he didn't spend a, he spent a lot of time being a fan and going to watch movies upstairs yeah. and stuff. And that that was that was cool. You know, that's so, his thing though. He's a huge movie buff. Yeah. Like when you hear him talk, him and Joe Dante's another one. Yeah. Those two are like like that's what they'll do, probably. If they're at a convention and there's movies showing, they'll go watch the movies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which I he, guess hey, cool. He did that a lot. Tim had a lot of downtime sitting at his table 
because you know, <laughs> he wasn't there. Um, so yeah, so Julian Sands was cool. You know, we it, it was just you know a little rough at the beginning, but he was awesome at the end. We, we make a fun of stuff. Um, and then the <laughs> next year, I got Robert England. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you know, so I had you know worked my way up, and this is actually that this is the first year I believe that Tim was not there. That was, so I guess the Landis year was the last year he was with me. Nothing bad happened. It's just, you know, Tim's work schedule and whatnot didn't let him go to the show anymore, yeah. unfortunately. So, yeah. So, you know, I had, you know, I was tight with Gina. We were friends. You know, I, I was doing a, a good job. So I was given, you know, Robert England the next year. That's which, awesome. Yeah, which was a big, big deal. And Robert, Robert's so cool. He was He's just so genuinely happy to be there and talking with fans, and he'll he'll talk to people for a while, you know, and he'll talk to the group of people. He, you know, so he gets everybody involved. He holds court. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great. You know, I saw one of the greatest things was, you know, Robert. If Robert saw a little kid that wasn't even in his line, he'd say he'd like say something as Freddie to the kid, and just, that's awesome. You know, yeah. So he saw this little girl, you know, like taking a picture of him. And he said something in the Freddy voice, you know, like, ah, oh, get over here, bitch, or whatever. You know, he'd, <laughs> yeah. he'd call a little kid a bitch. Um, but it scared the little girl. You know, he thought that he was yelling at her. She thought that. Um, and he wasn't. He was just, you know, being cool. Yeah. So she, like, kind of walked away, like, really scared. And he went and he went and got her. You know, he got out of his table, went past his table out into the, the area, you know, the common walking area. And found her, got her, brought her back to the table, signed an autograph, and talked to her. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, I'm like, you know, that that's the kind of stuff that, you know, that makes you feel like you're part of something special. Right. You know? Well, it's kind of cool, too, that he, um, he'll he even do, like, <clears throat> that he goes out there and he does his voice for people and stuff like yeah. that. Because a lot of those celebrities, like, like that, that are known for, like, characters, per se... To get them to do their character in public outside oh, yeah. of the film, they don't. That's like yeah, it's, it's like taboo. You don't ask them to do the character. You right. know what I mean? Right. You know, and <clears throat> he embraces Freddie, which is awesome. Right. Uh, you know, and on the other end of that spectrum, though, is you know, you get one out of every ten fans saying, "Can you do this voice?" Can mm-hmm. you, you know, so I, I understand both ways. Yeah, I can see but, from their point of view. Yeah. Yeah, but Robert's really cool with it. He he loves being a, a celebrity. You can you can yeah. tell, and I I would too. I don't blame him. Yeah. Right. Uh, but like if people brought a glove to be signed, he'd put it on, you know, oh, really? sign it and put it on and take a picture with it on for the guy. That's awesome. Yeah, it was great. Um, so Robert was just awesome. Did you guys get a lot of those um, those replica gloves? Yeah. Like the the, the real steel ones? They're, they're kind of yeah. heavy. We'd, we'd, get a, we'd get a mix of like I still the, want the one real of those steel ones. <laughs> yeah. And we, we get the, like the cheaper Halloween-y ones too, but you know. I used to have one, it had, but it had like a uh, like a camouflage, like a green camouflage. Ooh. The glove, yeah, they, they, when they, when, you know, back when we were growing up, the, the ones I used to sell, like they had a brown glove and they had one which was like a green camouflage glove. And for some reason, the one I ended up with was the crappy one that had the green glove. The brown glove looked like the movie sort of, but the green glove love just look like what is this like army freddy you know <laughs> yeah yeah i mean robert i can't say enough good things about robert um so we go we go to the next year and heather langenkamp is headlining because she had actually had to cancel the, the robert england year. Oh, so she wasn't there the year with robert england. no she was scheduled and canceled because her son had had to have brain surgery <laughs> And he was in, like, I think it was Germany, and she had to go fly out there to be with him. You know, there was an emergency. Yeah, that's rough. So she, you know, she had a legitimate reason to cancel. Right. So she came back, you know, the next year, and I got to work with her. So I'm like, man, I am all about nightmare. So, and she was, she is a sweetheart, too. What impressed me the most about her is how intelligent she was. And she actually researched local history of Worcester and the surrounding areas just to talk to the fans about oh. the town yeah i mean th- who does that yeah right right well she seems like a very like well i mean because she's like into like documentary filmmaking and stuff like that like she seems very like knowledgeable of a lot yeah. of things yeah like, she's a smart person i mean this is the impression impression i get of her i've never actually met her but <clears throat> yeah no she a very very intelligent woman i you know and i told her that too i was like you plus know, she's gorgeous like i want to I, I always thought she was cute even during the nightmare on elm street age but she's even prettier now that yeah. she's older yeah she yeah she uh Age has done well for her. 
but yeah, she was she was great. She was so smart, uh, and I told her how you know how impressed I was just as a human being with how intelligent she was, and you know we got we got along really well. Um, and so she was great. Uh, and what what I hated was how many people. Again, this is the thing we're talking about. How it's yeah. the same person says, you know, the, every person says like the same thing. Everybody would not everybody, you know, like half the people. It was that high. We're coming up to her and going, "Yeah, we wish you were here last year." But it like, and it's like, "Come on, come on!" Right. Like, why? Why do you go and see somebody you love, and then instantly make them feel bad? But this canceling? is the East Coast mentality, and this is what kind of sucks, even for like us with our filmmaking and stuff. And it's like we do the best we can, but like. The East Coast mentality is to always complain about the thing that's not there. Right. Like, it's right. like you don't enjoy what is there. It's like, well, how come you don't have this? Yeah. Or how come? It is. You've ever noticed that? Like, I mean, you work in retail, Newberry yeah. Comics. Mike works at a Newberry Comics store in uh, Dartmouth. He's the manager there. And it's like, you know, it, it, it's that's what the way people are around yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like, And yeah. it's different it's, across the country because, I mean, I lived in Chicago. I lived in the Midwest for six years. People are different out there. But... They're very nice, but they're fake nice too. Yeah. Like they're like everybody's smiling at you, everybody's happy all the time. Sometimes that does wear on you though. You're kind of like, well, just be real. It, you know it what I does. mean? It does. It like and like Rock and Shock is a very meat and potato show. Um, the Midwest seems to be where it's at for conventions because yeah, they get everything out they there, do. man. Like in the Indiana, Ohio, that that region. They always get like they, the horror hound ones and stuff like that, yeah. like the big ones. Like, they they do and. Uh, <clears throat> And, and it's amazing because because the fans get it there. They know how it runs. They know they have to pay for stuff. They're not expecting free stuff. Now, have you been to any out that far, or have like is as you? Oh, you have. I, I've been well. I've been to Ohio and to Indianapolis <clears throat> for for a few different shows, uh, and I went to New Jersey mm. for Mossmania a couple times, but that was within driving distance. Yeah. But yeah, I've flown. I love flying to shows. I, yeah. I really like flying. That's you know, cool. It's a nice getaway. Yeah, definitely. But yeah. Um, my the best day of my entire life was spent at a horror convention. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to hear? The yeah, story? T- tell me the okay. story. Yeah, um, I want to hear the story. Go for it. So, Clive Barker <laughs> was booked for a horror hound, and Clive Barker is my favorite creationist. I, you know, wait, that's that's a kind of religious thing. Uh, <laughs> creator. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, my favorite. You know, writer. Artist. You know, painter. Yeah, yeah my favorite. Right. My favorite imaginer. Yes. Um, you know, I, I've got some Hellraiser and some Clive Barker art tattooed on me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I could not miss this. And they were also showing the first public showing er, of the Cabal Cut of Nightbreed. Uh, which has become a pretty big thing now because yeah. of Scream Factory yeah, it's putting come, it out this year. Yeah, finally coming out on DVD this year. And this was 2010 when I, when I did this, so it took a couple of years. Um... So I couldn't miss this at all. And I'd already been to a horror hound at the same hotel uh, in 2007 when I met Gina. So I knew the layout. I knew what was going on. I was like, okay, got my ticket, et cetera. Bam, I'm there. Um, so the day Friday, uh, I, had, I, had a VIP, I bought a VIP ticket because that guaranteed me to meet him. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not fucking this up. Yeah, right, if you're going all the way out there. Right. And, and it also gave me, it also guaranteed me a seat to see uh, Nightbreed, you know. So I, I was like, how can I not get a VIP pass? So um, Friday comes, and my my selected date to meet him was Friday because they told you when you would meet him, you know, because they uh, obviously he's going to blow the doors off the place. So Friday's my day. I'm like, all right, I got my game plan going. I had a hotel room, you know, I was by myself, and I went down to the lobby around like noontime to just get some water and I you know I had nothing to do and I saw um, a guy named Mike he was an agent um, really cool guy Mike Baronis and he was representing at the show David Hess and Richard Lynch ah okay. yeah so I'm just thinking Clive Barker Clive Barker all day I'm just thinking about Clive yeah. and meeting him that night <laughs> So I see Mike in the lobby, and we and we shoot the shit because he's from around here too, you know. Um, and we're talking for a little bit, and then he gets a a phone call, and he looks at me and he goes, "Do you want to go meet Richard and David?" 
yeah (laughs) yeah of course yeah um and you know i i was a little intimidated to go meet david hess because he's david hess he's like you know he's He's deep, man. He's you and know he's you a know. he's a personality too. Yeah. Like he's a strong guy when you talk he to is. him. He is. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. If you're if you're fake, and he's not going to have any of it. So we go. Uh, there was another hotel adjoining the one I was in, and there was a walkway. We, we went to the next hotel, and it was a small hotel. And in the little cafe in the lobby, he was sitting reading. So we we talked for a little bit, and Mike introduced me. You know, said I was you know good people, and. After five minutes, he's like, okay, I got to go get Richard. So, Mike, you hang here with David and you guys talk. I go, oh, my God. <laughs> Leaves you alone with him. Yeah. That's like, like throwing you in the lion's den. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, do you, do you know he was in Last House on the Left? I can't talk to him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I had no choice. We had a talk. And, man, he was he was so intense, but he's so smart. He is. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, we talked about everything. We talked about, you know, he found out I worked for Newberry, and we talked about vinyl because he wanted to press some of his stuff on vinyl. and Which he finally did, which is, it's kind of almost, it's almost like bittersweet because, like, he wanted The Last House on the Left soundtrack. Like, he wanted to press that and, and some of his catalog on vinyl for a long time. Yeah. But when that first came out, while he was alive, it was just CD, and it came out. Like, his sons actually went and pressed that on vinyl yeah. after he died. So it's kind of bittersweet, in a, in a sense, it is, you know, it for is, him. But it's a great tribute. It is a it great is. tribute to him. Um, so we talked about that. We talked about Rock and Shock, because I was trying to pimp Rock and Shock, because I, I knew Mike and Gino were probably already on it, but I'm like, I'll throw my two cents in. Because I was just, and timeline-wise, I was just coming off of the Rock and Shock with Malcolm. So I, I was really, you know, I was yeah. having some great convention experiences. Um, so I'm really pushing it. Um, and he wanted his, he wanted to like bring his music to the show. And I'm like, oh, they kind of do a little different thing with music. But, you know, whatever. It's not my call. Um, I mean, he could have probably, he could have had his CDs on his table. He, but Oh, yeah. yeah, he did. Yeah. He, and he did. But he, he wanted to play live. Oh, he wanted to play live. Yeah. Okay. I'm like, you know, um, maybe something else. But I don't know about the Palladium. But that's, you know, I had no idea. So... And then we started getting a little deeper. We talked about travel and, you know, and I'm like, yeah, I've come out here a couple of times. He's like, no, you got to like, you got to get out there. And he's like really inspiring me to like get a passport and stuff and oh. experience the world. And then we got a little bit deeper and we started talking about sex and the, the philosophy of why men don't want to wear condoms because they have a natural ingrained alligator brain instinct you fell procreate. into the uh you fell into the i mean I've, I've i've told my david hess stories before on the podcast but you fell into the david hess sex bubble yes <laughs> like david hess is a filthy fucking oh, guy when yes. you talk to him and if, if he gets you in that conversation and he knows he can go with you on yeah. that kind con- like him and my my friend liza like oh my god the things that they say back they'd said back and forth to each other it's yeah, it's it- it's it's shameful. <laughs> yeah, he, I mean, God, yeah, it's he was intense with it, but I mean, but he's honest. Was, he's a very honest guy. He he's is. straightforward. And you know, and that was a good point about you know your alligator brain, your male instinct to procreate. You know, I, I don't know that there's there's probably a lot of people who have no desire to procreate and don't want to be anywhere <laughs> yeah, near right. kids, but they still want to fuck. Um, but you know, but it was a very interesting philosophy, and he was really smart and just, and I really appreciated that time with him. Um, and then, and you know, he, he kept saying stuff and going, I shouldn't say this, but Mike says you're a good guy. So I'll say it. And they would say this bizarre thing. And, and I really loved it. And then Mike came back down with, uh, with Richard Lynch and they, you know, Mike and David, I mean, Richard and David talked for a little bit and then Richard stuck his hand out to me and he's like, hi, I'm Richard Lynch. And I'm like, I know who you are, man. But, but I'm like, you know, I was so appreciative yeah. that he, he took me in too. I'm like, Mike took me in, David took me in, now Richard Lynch took me in as like part of this group. And, you know, and I'm always grateful to Mike for, for like, ha- let me tag along. Right. So after that, they're like, okay, you want to go to lunch? I'm like, and, and, and I'm thinking, do I go? Am I, and Mike's like, yeah, you're, you're with us. Like, That's I'm, awesome. I'm going to lunch with you guys? You're part of the group. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm just a fan from Massachusetts. So, you know, I don't, I don't mean doodly squat, but, I'm, you know, thanks to Mike, I'm, I'm in this group now. And we go, we go to the, well, we walk the, we walk the hall that was, you know, they were setting it up and find out where the tables were. And, like, 
Tom Savini came over and there were some fun exchanges and I'm like I'm this I'm behind the scenes. <laughs> That's this is great. Um, and then we went to the restaurant and uh, and Gina joined us um, and she she was going to be working. She wasn't she wasn't there to work, but she was going to be helping out on something, which I'd find out, you know, later cuz she didn't want to talk about it. Um, so we had lunch. And I'm at this table with these amazing people eating a meal and, and all these fans are coming through the restaurant and just like stopping and gawking and they're probably going who is that guy yeah well they're probably <laughs> thinking you're somebody else yeah. they're probably saying, they're probably trying to think wait what is that guy in yeah like because Yo, you're yeah. with them yeah <laughs> right. so and, you know and i have like a distinctive look too you know yeah right the, you the do beard and everything um so it's amazing and, and we're having and and david and richard are telling these hollywood stories and these old new york stories because they were both from new york and they're like they're loud and they're swearing but you know who's gonna say no to them right you know they're they have command presence in that 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 restaurant yeah and fans are watching and uh ken foray comes over and says hi uh ashley lawrence comes over and says hi i think this is the greatest day of my life well, yeah, because you're with the the kind of like the old guard, like yeah. you're with the the classic guys, like so, like even the younger audience, like you said, like Ashley Lawrence and stuff like that, they look at them like, oh, those are the guys that were in the movies that I love. Yeah. So you're with them, yeah. which is kind of impressive. And like, and you know, and they're tight with with Gina and Mike too, you know, because you know they run the shows right. and whatnot. So it was, this was great. I am I am so thankful for this experience, and I'm like, and I haven't even met Clive Barker yet. <laughs> I know, huh? Yeah. Wow. So. So the, we, we finished lunch, and Richard pays for everybody, and that was really cool. I appreciated that. Um, and then we got to go back. Uh, Mike asked me to take Richard back to the hotel because he's got to do something with David, and Richard wants to go take a quick nap before the show starts, you know, because he's, you know, like 70 years old. Yeah, he is up there. Yeah. yeah. Both of them were, actually. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but, you know, David, it was like a, you know, he had the energy of a 45-year-old. He did, year old. actually. He uh, actually he 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 uh he used to lie about his age too. He yeah. told people that he was like sixty nine and he was actually like seventy four. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I so I bring Richard back to the hotel room, and you know I drop him off. I'm like, yeah, Mike's gonna come back and get you and whatever. And he's like, okay, great. Um, and then I I and then I look at my watch. I'm like, oh man, it's like almost time for the show. Like I gotta get my Barker game plan going. So I like race back through the little the little uh, walkway to the other hotel, and this this guy stops me and he's like, "Hey, uh, is there a way that I can get an interview with with Richard? Because he'd see me bring him back." And I'm like, "You think I'm important? <laughs> yeah, he thinks you're like his handler or like agent yeah. or something." Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, "No, but you know, go at his go to his table and see his actual agent there, Mike. You know, and to set something up. I don't know. I'm like, I gotta go get my bag. So I go up to my room, get my stuff." And I come down, and I go to Barker's waiting room because Barker's going to sign in one room, and then they had the waiting room in the next room because they get you know they got a lot of people to fit in the, you know right in this. So I get in. I'm like the I don't know thirty thirtieth person maybe in line, but it's rows of chairs. So luckily, where I get seated is the first seat of the second row. So I can see everything that's going to go on now. And the guy next to me was the first guy in line, you know. And, and you know, I talked to him for a little bit. He's he was kind of obnoxious, but, you know, a little overbearing. But whatever. I'm I'm still beaming from the lunch. Right. Um, And I realized that it's like 4 o'clock. Barker's not going to start signing till 7, you know. And the show started at 5 for the guests like it was 4 o'clock to 5 was early admission so you could see the vendors or whatever I just went and got in line um, but yeah 5 o'clock was when the guests started Barker said he'd sign at 7 um, Barker wasn't feeling too well etc cetera, etc cetera. I'll get to that so I know I have 3 hours to kill in this waiting room I don't care I'm I'm still beaming from the lunch. Right. I'm just going over it and over it in my head. I'm like, this is gonna kill some time just thinking about how awesome this day yeah. is. Um, and you know the people around were were kind of decent. The guy got a little obnoxious, but whatever. <laughs> um. So then, um, you know, har- the horror hound staff kept coming in and updating us, and you know, so Clive was gonna start around seven. You know, he was a little late, but you know, it's fine. 
So around 6.30, I guess, um, a film crew comes in. And they're doing a documentary on Clive. They're working with Clive. They're not just some outside thing. And they want to talk to the first guy in line, which is the guy next to me, the obnoxious guy. <laughs> like, great. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm, I'm sitting right next to him. So I'm, I'm just kind of watching. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, whatever, cool. And, you know, and I see the, the guy who's doing the interviews. And I'm like, this, this guy looks familiar. And, and then they finish with him. And they're like, oh, you know, okay, maybe we'll talk to some other people. And I put my head down. I said, I, I don't ask me to talk. I don't want to talk. I don't want to <laughs> be on. I don't want to be on camera. I'm not an actor. Yeah. Um, not yet. Yeah. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> uh, so I'm like, don't, 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 don't ask me. And I'm like, I know I look. I got all these tattoos, and just please don't ask me. <laughs> and the lady, the the PA that was helping him, uh, turns to me and she goes. Hi, w- would you like to be interviewed? I went, yes. <laughs> <laughs> just, Even with the weight, it just like came out. <laughs> yeah, it was, the, it was this immediate turnaround from yeah. don't to yes. <laughs> so I signed this release and they take a picture of me holding it. I'm like, this is an official business going yeah. on. Um, so I meet the interviewer, Joe. Who well, they actually took a picture of you holding the release. Holding the release, As yeah. part of the release form. Yes. Oh, that's an interesting. Yeah. Okay, that's, yeah. that's cool to know. Um, as like proof that I signed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we should do that from yeah, now on. <laughs> Actually, that's a, that's a really good idea. That's what we're doing. <laughs> that's, okay. Um, so the interviewer comes over to me, the guy who's running the deal, and it turns out that this guy is Joe Berlinger. Oh, shit, the documentarian, the, uh, yes. Paradise Lost. Paradise uh, Lost yeah. and the, the ill-fated director of the Blair Witch Blair 2. Blair Witch 2, yeah. <laughs> Which I actually like. Oh, he, he made so much fun of himself for doing that movie. Really? But, yeah, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, but yeah, it's it's Joe Berlinger. I'm like, this, wow, that's crazy. Joe Berlinger yeah. is doing this documentary. It's going to be amazing. Wow. So, you know, I got cred. But before I realized who it was, he he interviewed me. And he totally baited me. He was so good at what he did. Because I, I had a Hellraiser shirt on. I had my tattoos going. And so he, he talks to me about Clive and why I like him and stuff. And I'm I'm like deep. With my answers, because you know, I really, I really like Clive Barker. Yeah. So, and then he baits me, and he looks and he goes, "Oh, so you like Hellraiser?" Like looking at my shirt, and I, I roll my eyes. I'm just like, like no, like you know, what do you? What, <laughs> After what, all that, yeah, yeah like, that's what, what you're gonna ask. What company do you work for? Exactly. Like, come on, and like, yeah, and I just like put my shirt out, and like, of course I do, and then I show him my my pinhead tattoo, and he's like, oh. And I'm like, oh, this dude just baited me. This is great. You know, great. That was all. He did a good job. So I showed him my, my tattoos. I got the pinhead. I've got the puzzle box. Um, and I've got a Clive uh, Demon art piece on me. That's cool. And uh, and so now it gets more interesting. He's like, oh, can you can you stand up and show show these to the camera? Like, of course I can. Now I'm into it. <laughs> I'm like, this is great. So I show all the tattoos, and everybody's like, oh, this is really cool. He really likes Clyde Barker, blah, blah, So they finish up the interview, and then they go off and interview a couple other people in the crowd. And I'm like, this is... Yeah, this day is getting even better. Yeah, no shit, huh? This is like, yeah, yeah. this is like, you know, like a like a crazy story of yeah. this whole like event. I'm like, I've just been interviewed by the guy who did Paris Lost. You know, on the same day that you had lunch that, with fucking David yeah. Hess and Richard Lynch, and this is insane. And I still have not met Clive Barker. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just I'm just sitting there in seventh heaven, and we start to we, the line starts to assemble. So they took the first row of people out, and then it, it would snake up back to me. And I'm so lost in my happiness. I didn't even know we were lining up. The guy next to me had to elbow me, and he's like, dude, c- come on. It's your turn in line. I'm like, oh, 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 okay. <laughs> and I stood up, and I got in line, and we you know, we went out of the room we were in, and in the hallways where you paid for your autographs, it was a six autograph maximum, which I, I got all six. Um, and I'm usually, I, I usually don't go that crazy for autographs, but I'm like – I'm getting six autographs. Yeah. If, if that's what I can get, I'm going to get it. And, yeah. I, you know, I'm not an eBay guy or any of that bullshit. I, no, you, know. so you wanted it for yourself. Yeah. yeah you're a collector. I did. Yeah. So, you know, I got my six autograph tickets and uh, we went into the next room. And the room, like Barker was at 
near the door, but he was to the left. And the line kind of went in and off to the right and snaked around the room back to Barker. So you could leave right after you after you got your autographs. Yeah. So as soon as you walk in the door, there's a handwritten sign on an easel from Clive that says he's very sorry, but he has no voice because he, you know he's having throat problems. He's really sick and he can't talk. And he loves us, but he, he can't have conversation with us. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, we're like, oh, but but it's, but it's still it's still Clive yeah, it's Clive Barker. So you and immediately after you take a couple steps in the room and you obviously the first thing you do is watch Clive. Yeah, and you notice, wait a minute, he's talking to everybody. Uh, Despite what he had written, he loves the fans to such so a degree. Much that he's talking to him. He's talking to everybody. Wow, that's pre- that's impressive. Yeah. So I, I make my way around the room, and then I see Gina. That was her job. She was helping work his table ah, for the okay. weekend. So she went as a fan, but, you know, they know she runs a show, and she was friends with them, with the Harham guys. So they asked her to help out. And, you know, so she told me what the deal was. And the, the deal, I gave her the, my autograph tickets. Um, the deal was you had your camera ready. You gave it to the Harham staff guy in front of the table. Sat down. Get your autograph, take the picture, move on. Because that, you know, they got to do it quick. They got to keep the line yeah. going. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I said, okay, no problem. So I get up and I'm next. I said, oh man, I'm next. I'm, I am so nervous. Um, and I go <laughs> and I give my, my camera to the staffer. And the staffer taking the pictures was a guy named Jerem. And I had met him the day before. Because I, I, I get to shows a day early. I like to do that. And I was just sitting in the lobby watching people. And he came over with one of the writers from Horror Hound, and they were checking out my tattoos, and they were, they were really cool. And I met him that way. And then I saw him the next day when I asked where Clive's room was, and he pointed me, and he's like, hey, man, what's up? So I kind of already knew him a little bit, just a tiny bit. Yeah. But we knew each other, you know, facial recognition kind of thing. Mm. We thought the other, both thought the other one was cool. Right. So I gave him my camera, like, hey, man, what's up? And then I sat with Clive, and I shook his hand. I'm like, man, I, this is awesome. And he just he starts signing. And I, I just start, like, asking him questions, you know, like, hey, you know, what do you got coming on next? And, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, just making small talk. Yeah. And he's like, oh, I really don't like to say because it never, you know, never ends up working. It's like, yeah, and then everybody gets all bullshit at you. And he's like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we just, we just made small talk. It was no big deal. Um, but then I noticed that. Berlinger and the camera crew were filming this. Like they they were filming my inter. They didn't film with everybody, but they were they filming- were filming you because they had already had an interaction. Yeah, with you. yeah, yeah. So everybody they had talked to in the other room, they were they were filming. They were following these people. Yeah. I said, oh man, this is great. I'm being filmed for this too. So we you know we talk a little bit and um, we took our picture and Jerem Jerem took our picture and it was great. And then I said, you know, oh, can I show you, you know, my tattoos? You know, I showed the, these guys on camera. And he's like, yeah, all right, great. So I showed him Pinhead, and he's like, oh, you know, that's really cool. And then I showed him the puzzle box. And my puzzle box isn't like a 3D one. It's, it's each side of the puzzle box, one on top of right, the other. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so it's different. Yeah. Um, and he appreciated that. And he was like, he was, it's on my leg. So I put my leg up on the chair, and he's like touching it. And he's like <laughs> asking about, you know, how long it took and stuff like that. And I showed him his art piece, and he was like, oh, okay, cool. But then he started looking at my other tattoos. And I have one from a Joe Lindsner comic called Dawn. It's a comedy and tragedy. They're, they've got the masks and their yeah, skeletons. I know, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, wearing the priest robes. And he loved those. And he started asking me questions about them, about the comic and stuff. Huh. And he gives me a notepad and a Sharpie and says, can you please write all that information down so I can go find it? Wow. I'm like, wow, now I'm giving comic recommendations. Well, you like recommended, yeah, right, comic soon. So I, I wrote it all down. I'm like, this is amazing. Uh, I have a Lucio Fulci zombie tattoo. Which is amazing, actually. Yeah, I mean, I'm sitting you. here looking at it right now. You guys can't see it, but the detail is incredible in this thing. Yeah, I, it, yeah, it took... And the coloring is really good in it, too, yeah, actually. Yeah, <laughs> it took like 10 hours and two-hour really? two hour sessions. Wow. Yeah, it, yeah, it took a lot of work, but it, it, it came out so well. Um, and he started talking to me about, oh, I, I knew I knew Fulci, and he was a really nice man, and you know, mm-hmm. and I'm like, wow, this is great, <laughs> and you know, and I'm and we're being filmed, and Jerem is taking pictures. He's he keeps snapping pictures, and for everybody else, it's you know, you get your one picture, 
but it's like I don't know if he knew or if he just kind of liked me because you know we were talking. For maybe a he bit. noticed that you were being filmed as well, so he, he was just taking maybe. more just to take more. Yeah, because yeah. he's got one shot of me with Clive and the film crew in the foreground filming it. I, that's one of my prized pictures. Yeah, and he just keeps snapping pictures, and it's great. And I'm like shaking just talking to Clive, and I'm just having the best time because Clive was kept asking about me. Right. You know, Clive wasn't a celebrity. He was, He was. I love my fans, and I'm going to find out everything I can about my fans. That's cool. That's it really is. cool, actually. It, it was the greatest celebrity encounter I've ever had. Well, that's quite a story. <laughs> it, it that is. whole day is quite a story. Yeah. I, I walked out of that room. You know, once, once we finished and we shook hands again, I, I walked out of that room shaking like a leaf. You know, I, I picked up my autographs, and before I could even walk out of the room... Berlinger said, you know, can we talk to you again? Can we do, like, another interview? Yeah, like like, they wanted yeah. to do, like, a follow-up. Yeah, know. and, you know, he's like, you know, did, was it, how did you, how did you like it? Was it better than you expected to be? I'm like, yeah. I, <laughs> I'm in a daze just talking about how awesome it was. And it was so great. And then they finished talking to me, and I, I left the room. And I bent down to, like, start putting my stuff away in my in my Devil's Rejects messenger bag from Sid Haig. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, and then Berlinger and his camera guy walked out of the room and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, man, that was amazing. And I'm like, thank you. You know, that. thank you for saying that as a filmmaker. Yeah, yeah. And, and yes, I agree. It was amazing. Has this ever surfaced, this documentary? Have no. You, no. No. Okay. He, um, he didn't have the funding to finish it. And I always hate it when that happens when, like, you know, I'm like, man, you know, where's the Kickstarter thing? And It happens a lot with documentaries, too, especially, yeah. like, niche documentaries, I've noticed. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so the, the last word I got about it, uh, sometime last mm. year, somebody asked him about it, and he said, you know, he's considering doing a Kickstarter, but he's not sure because he'd have to finish it. And, I mean, you know, from the time from that to now, Barker's been through hell. Yeah. You know, he was in a coma. He, you know, he had the toxic shock thing. Right. Um, you know, all kinds of stuff. He got, you know, he got dropped by his his adult fiction publisher. Dropped him because they wanted him to finish the rest of the Aberat, you know, kids yeah. quote unquote kids book series. So they wouldn't publish any of his adult stuff until he finished it. Wow. Like they're like handcuffing him. Like so much has happened. It could make such a great documentary. Um, so I hope it it works out. I wonder if they've actually kept up with them through it all. Like I, I hope so. It would be I mean, it would be an interesting follow through if they've kind of gone back. Those guys seem pretty good with that. Like they, they well, I mean, look at the Paradise Lost stuff. I mean, right. You know what I mean? If they knew there was a story there, I would imagine that they would try to get themselves back involved in it. You know? I I would really love to see it. And like even if you go on <laughs> Berlinger's site website and watch the trailer he made for it, I mean, it is the most intense. Because it's just Barker talking. Yeah. And he is so intense and just so right on with what he's saying. I, I, I just, I mean, the man is just so wise. No, you didn't end up in the trailer. You said the trailer is just Clive No, the Barker. trailer is just Clive talking. Oh, interesting. From an interview, you know. Uh, he's a fascinating guy, though. Like, I actually, I'd be very interested to see this documentary, a documentary on Clive Barker. Yeah. Because, I mean, he's, I have a friend who uh, lives in uh, California. His name is Tony Silva. And, uh, or Sin Silva, he calls himself. <clears throat> um. Uh, he became friends and he worked with Clive Barker for a while. Yeah. And I've heard some, yeah, I didn't hear too many stories through him other than the fact that he, Clive Barker was a really good, great guy. I mean, that was the general consensus was he was an awesome guy. Yeah. And he spent a lot of time with him too, I suppose, apparently. So <clears throat> yeah, that, that night, I mean, Barker, you know, as sick as he was, and again, he's talking to everybody and he was sick because I could barely hear, like I had to lean yeah. in and listen to what he was saying. Was, well, there was no a period voice. of time there. There's some interviews on some of the, like the Hellraiser stuff where you can hear his voice is really, really yeah, raspy. Yeah, he, he has uh, throat polyps okay. that keep resurfacing, <laughs> so he go, keeps having to get them removed. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. Um, but even as sick as he was, he was only supposed to sign from like 7 to 9, this crazy two-hour thing. But the show was over that night at, I think, 10, and you walk by his room, he's still signing. And everybody in line, he signed for. That's impressive. Yes. Saturday, he signed. You know, and even even the Q and A with him and the the showing of the Cabal cut was supposed to start at a certain time, but it was it was like an hour late because he was signing. Yeah. 
Sunday, he wasn't even supposed to be there. He came back on Sunday to sign for the people who didn't get signed on Saturday. That's that's awesome. So he was so Especially dedicated. Especially for somebody who's sick, like you said. Who's right. Not in a good health at that point. <laughs> yeah, even even on stage when he was doing his Q&A, he was like, he was hunched over. You know, he was definitely not. And you could still, with a microphone, could barely hear what he was saying. Yeah, right. Yeah. No, so wait. So, okay, now. So the, uh, the Cabal cut is is his cut. That's it, his preferred edit of the movie, right? Yeah, um, it's breed? it's what he would have done with the movie if Morgan Creek hadn't stepped in and tried to make it a slasher film. Now, did um I I, I haven't seen Nightbreed in a while. You know more about it than I do. Yeah. Um, did he actually direct Nightbreed, or is it directed yeah. by somebody else? No, he directed it. <laughs> oh, okay. He wrote the script and directed it. And so he only directed two movies, three. right? Three. He because Hellraiser, Nightbreed, and what was his third? Uh, and Lord of Illusions. Oh, he directed Lord of Illusions. I've yeah. actually never seen Lord of Illusions yeah. either. Yeah, it's good stuff. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But wow. So that, I mean, that, you know, and, and after Barker, I went and met Elvira, and I love Elvira to pieces. Yeah, she's awesome. Um, she said I was in ZZ Top. She's freaking hot, too. Yeah, yeah. She's, <laughs> yeah, she's in her 60s, and she's gorgeous. Um, you know, and, and I, you know, finished the night out, you know, but that, that was the greatest day of my life. I get, yeah, that would be the greatest day of my life too. If yeah. <laughs> I had that day, that's kind of a crazy. Yeah. It's an insane day. Yeah. But like that's that's a nuts story. Like I, I mean, is that the, the did you have? I mean, you've gone to other conventions. Yeah. Uh, other than oh, that, yeah. you got any you got any other crazy stories? We can we can go a little longer here if you want. Yeah, I'm I'm cool with it. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. You've got good stories, so I do. This is good. I do. Um, oh, so Doug Bradley. Ah, Doug Bradley. Uh, yeah, yeah, you've told me these. Okay, let's yeah. let's do the Doug, Doug Bradley stories. Doug Bradley, I love Doug Bradley to pieces. Um, other than Malcolm McDowell, Doug Bradley is my favorite, my second favorite actor. Yeah. Um, which is funny because you know, a lot of people go, "Oh, he's just Pinhead." No, he's done a lot of other stuff, but you know, but I love Doug, and Pinhead's my favorite horror character, and Hellraiser is my favorite horror movie. Yeah. You know, and again, Barker connection. You know, it all goes full circle. <clears throat> right. So the second Rock and Shock that I went to, so 2006, um, they were not only having a Devil's Rejects reunion with seven different people from the movie, which which is it is definitely in my top five favorite movies yeah, of too. all time. Me too. <laughs> and they were having that, and they were having Doug Bradley. I I I almost flipped out and just died. So. I'm like, okay, this is Rock and Shock really stepping it up. So I went, and first night, you know, it was the first time they had a Friday, Saturday, Sunday lineup instead of just Saturday, Sunday. I was like, oh, this this is amazing. I brought my Hellraiser posters and all this. I'm like, I'm meeting Doug Bradley, crazy. I had my pinhead tattoo already. So I go up to Doug on the first night, and I am, again, nervous as anything. <coughs> I'm still pretty new at it. It's only my second convention. Yeah. And I wanted to show him my tattoos, and I had the puzzle box tattoo already, and the the pinhead one, and the the puzzle box is on my leg, pinhead one's on my my arm, both on my left side. So I wanted to meet him and say, "Can I show you my tattoos?" But I'm so nervous and so new at all this. I shook his hand, and he said, "Hi, how you doing?" In his very proper British accent. Yeah. And I said, "Hi." And I didn't even say anything. I did this karate demonstration to show him my tattoos. <laughs> I sh- I lunged out with my left arm to show him my pinhead, and then I stuck my leg up in the air like I was gonna kick him to show him the puzzle box. He was like, "What the hell?" Yeah, because I hadn't even <laughs> yeah. I hadn't even said a word to him yet. Yeah. I'm just like, hey, "Look at this." And in his you know in his British way, he looked at them and he looked at me and he went, "Huh." <laughs> like, like well, who is this crazy person uh, yeah who is this guy yeah <laughs> so i was like oh man that was really stupid so i got some autographs and i said okay and i got out of line and i said man that was really dumb so i went back in his line that night because i had for- totally forgotten in my excitement to get my hellraiser poster signed so he signed that and then Saturday, I went back again and got more autographs from him. And he was like, oh. Was like, what, what is this guy? He, yeah, he loves I know. me. Well, he's, he's like, oh, hi, it's you again. And I was like, oh, man, he still hates me. Oh, no. Because there's nothing worse than somebody you really like either being an asshole or hating you. Yeah. And, you know, and it happens. But, uh, but yeah. I know you get that uncomfortable feeling that they're just not digging you. And it's yeah. like, you know. Yeah, I got really bummed out. 
uh, one year at, at Horror Hound, one of the first time I met Tom Savini, because he's Tom Savini's very hit or miss. He's either really cool or he's yeah. really not cool. I think I kind of got that with uh, with Jordy White, with Twiggy from Marilyn uh, Manson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the weirdness when I met him and stuff like that. I think I kind of... Like I was trying not to be fanboy, but it was just yeah. it was a little hard, and I think he was just kind of weirded out by me at first. Yeah. <laughs> but like, yeah, it's yeah, and it's but like you can't it's, help it. It's fifty fifty. I've definitely been the asshole or yeah. the the you know overzealous fan, and I've also had people celebrities who were just jerks, you know, like right, Michael Bean. But then I met Adam Green that same year, last year, and I stood there and talked to him for like ten minutes, yeah. and he was awesome. He was just like totally having a regular conversation with yeah. me. Adam's he's a really a reg- cool guy. Yeah, he's a regular dude. He doesn't charge for autographs. He's just he's one of us. He's a fan. Um, but my Bradley experience yeah, got continue. better. So Saturday, he's like, "Oh, it's you again, whatever." And we got stuff signed. And I'm like, oh, "Okay, I'm still not hitting it off with this guy." So I didn't go back on Saturday. But then Sunday came. I'm like, well, got to keep, got to go back again. It's another day. And he had a Q&A that day. So I went in the morning, and Sunday, as I said, is really slow. So I got some more autographs, and I said, oh, I, you know, I got some questions for you, but I'll, I'll save them for, uh, for the Q&A. He's like, that's good, because there's probably not going to be a lot of people there. And I said, oh, well, I'll be ready. And by Sunday, he actually asked me what quotes I wanted on the pictures, because I'd already gotten a ton yeah. of autographs from him. He had... 12 pictures on the table and by the end of sunday i had all 12 that's because I, I was insane and i had a job where i made a lot of money that but which i'm not at right now uh, <laughs> <laughs> which isn't the current job right now but unfortunately no they they treat me well but they, yeah exactly. yeah they treat me well where the other job didn't so anyway there you go um so so he's so where, where he's he warmed up to me on sunday he's like oh what quotes do you want whatever and i had quotes so I was I passed that test, and then I asked questions at the Q and A, and things were okay. You know, then at that Clive Barker show, he was there too because they had a, you know big reunion, and I saw him again, and his girlfriend was there, who I've come to know over the years too, and she saw my pinhead tattoo, and she was trying to point it out to him, and I was I was kind of moving my arm so he wouldn't see it because I didn't want any. I'm not that guy. No, nope, yeah. I'm not him. Um. But he was really honest because the Cabal Cut was in really rough shape at that yeah. time. They had just like put it together of VHS elements. I think and it stuff. still is. Like I think it, they're working on it, but I don't know. I don't know. I mean, they they they, they mentioned like a Blu-ray release of it coming up, but I don't think it's gonna be at, high quality. Like, well, as of right now, there it's gonna be a two disc with Nightbreed, and Nightbreed will be on Blu-ray, and Cabal Cut will be on DVD. Ah, okay, so that's what they're doing with it. Yeah. Okay. Um, but but this was even like there were Freedom. there were parts <laughs> that where the the sound didn't match the lips. There were, you know, unfinished no you know no effects yeah. scenes, and yeah. you know, and they've. Over the past couple of years, they've refined that and made things work and added music and oh, stuff. I see. And when I saw it again last year, I mean, it's it's like night and day because they've actually done so much. It's work more like it. a movie now. It right. feels more than, than like a work print. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. It was it was okay. totally a work print. Um, so I you know I saw Bradley again and he was talking about how rough it was. He's like, look, I'm going to be honest with you. It's in rough shape. It's great to see this footage, but it's in rough shape. You know, don't expect Spartacus. <laughs> Um, so, you know, whatever, that was a cool meeting. Uh, then he was at rock and shock that same year. And that was the year I worked for Julian Sands and he kept coming over and talking to Julian cause you know, they're from the same area, uh, about, uh, soccer or football, you know, English football. Um, but I went to Doug and I gave him, um, a CD of Vincent Price and, uh, reading, uh, Vince, uh, reading Edgar Allan Poe stories. Because okay. he's Bradley's big into Poe and, and you know the classic literature. And yeah. He he puts out audio books of them called Spine Chillers. You're the thoughtful fan. You're I the, yeah. You're the one I, that actually gives the like people st- cool stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know. You know. I like I like Doug Bradley. I knew he'd like it. So. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but he was really happy. He's like, oh, I've never even seen this before. And so he you know he gave me like an autograph and and he was like, you know, what's your name again? I know I see you from time to time. I'm like, oh, Mike. I I don't ever expect anybody to remember my name. They meet thousands of people. And right you're gonna remember my name yeah but he's like oh, okay cool that's great thank you you know thank you mike so that was rock and shock and then a year later he did a signing in salem massachusetts uh at the at the corner count orlock's museum and i was in line to get my tickets when he arrived and he came up behind me and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said in my ear 
Hi, Mike. How you doing? And I said, wait a minute. You a year later now you remembered my name. I said that's incredible. You know that was entirely different. Um, so I, you know things had changed now between me and Mr. Bradley. Yeah, that's nuts that he actually remembered who you yeah, were from karate demonstration to to that. Um, so I went through the line, and then it was funny because the person who was taking his money, who I found out later was the mother of the guy who runs you know Counter Relax. Yeah, she came up behind me and she goes. Do you know who that is? I'm like, well, obviously he just said hi, Mike. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, but I was right. nice, you know. So I, I said, yeah, I, I do. And she goes, that's the Hellraiser. <laughs> the Hellraiser. <laughs> so you don't really know. Who that is. It's like Brinky Stevens, the horror queen. That's that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, then he did Rock and Shock the next year, and I, one of my one of my fellow volunteers and I, uh, we got to hang with him and his girlfriend. Um, because there's a, there's a private area after the show for volunteers and the celebrities to, you know, unwind and get a meal and yeah. stuff. And I got to hang out with them and I had water and they were, you know, they had beers or whatever and just talk like regular people. That's awesome. And I said, how far have I come? And all, all of these stories, all of these, you know, perks that I've gotten are thanks to being a volunteer. Yeah. And, 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 and Rock and Shock has been kind of like the the, the, the giver <laughs> yeah, for you. You've I, gotten so I much am, from it. I will never forget it, and I'm so grateful. You know, I don't take it for granted, and I never expect it. Right. But it's so, you know, it's so great that it happened. That's that's awesome, man. Yeah. That's really, really cool. <clears throat> um, yeah, well, how, how do you, <laughs> I don't know how to top those stories. Those are kind of crazy. <laughs> I don't really, personally, I mean, I have, a, I've met a few people. I think I've, I've talked about my David Hess experience before on this and like, yeah, I met Twiggy. I met, I met William Cat from, uh, oh, from yes. okay, he was cool. Yes. He was actually really nice, but it's been very, actually my, my, my only other story story from conventions was meeting Camille Keaton from I Spit on Your Grave. That's it. When I met her, I, I walked up to her and I told her all about, uh, I actually documented this. <laughs> I have it on camera. Um, uh, about um, when I first saw I Spit in Your Grave, being at my parents' house, being at my, my house, um, and we I had rented it from the video store down the street, and I brought it back to the house and started watching it. And while I was watching it, my Uncle Russell just happened to be stopping by to say hi to my mom for some reason or whatever. And he saw what I was watching on the TV and he's like, he actually asked, he didn't even ask me, he didn't tell me, which was really, which, which I found really weird. He asked my mom to tell, ask me to turn it off while he was in the house <laughs> because he, 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 he knew what it was. And he was like, and I told Camille Keaton that story and she got a real kick out of that story. So, <laughs> so that, that was cool. And then she was really nice and I took pictures with her and stuff like that. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I, my, my, is like the convention king he's got the convention stories but <laughs> yes man they're, they're the time of my life that's awesome man yeah. um well you know what we're gonna um we're getting close to it at hour and 42 right now we're gonna uh we're gonna start wrapping it up now but what we'll do is uh to, to finish it off we're gonna do our incidents progress report because cool. i would have done it at the beginning but i kind of forgot about it and then i realized <laughs> that we'll do it now so all right what i'm gonna try to explain what this is is um, if you've been paying attention to me babble on for the past couple of uh, months now, uh, you know Roadkill Entertainment is our production entity, is our company, and we've been making horror films. I made a film called Hometown. Mike was involved in that. Uh, me and Mike together made a movie called You Better Watch Out, and we are in the very early stages of a movie called Incidents. Now, this is the Incidents Progress Report. And every time I have Mike on the show, I'm um, going to, or even if, say, say um, you're not going to be on the show that week or something like that, but we're around and we're busy and we're doing something, I might just pull out the recorder and we'll, we'll, we'll say where we're at. Cool. And then I'll just kind of like, I'll cut that into the show as like this week's Incidents Progress Report. <laughs> this week uh, in the news. Um, live on the scene. Yes, live on the scene. Um but anyway, so the so this is going to be called the Incidents Progress Report, and uh, the movie we're working on right now is called Incidents. So, but where 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 are we with this movie right now? Um, we I've got we've uh, it, the the intention is to have four stories in the film. We've basically got the four stories mapped out. We've got the first story completely scripted already. We've actually got the cast and um, the location. 
we pretty much the first story like ready to go. We just got to get started on rehearsals and stuff like that. I mean, I don't know. You have anything to say about this so far? No, I mean, I mean, it's early process right now, but <laughs> right. I mean, the the first story, you know, Jay Jay wrote the first story. Um, we're each going to write two stories in this one, so we're going to you know do Jay's and then we'll do mine and Jay's and mine. Yeah, uh, theoretically. Um, but yeah, Jay's came together really well. He you know. You I'm have, actually really, have, I'm really happy with it. Like yeah. as far as like these, these short vignettes and the movies that we've been making so far, it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about this movie for some reason. I think, I think that there's like a kind of maturity to our, our storytelling that has happened over the course of making these movies that I'm, I'm going to be impressed to see what we come up with this time yeah. for the stories. Yeah. We're, I mean, we're, you know, obviously the goal is to get better with everyone and you know, there, there's. There's a new maturity to this one, and at the same time, the stories are really fucked up. They're really fucked. I mean, yeah. they're God, they're they're really fucked. Up. Yeah, they're. I mean, we've had the um, we've had a poster that we made for the movie online for a while now, just because I I I have this thing where like uh, not only am I a I mean I'm sitting in a room surrounded by movie posters, but I'm a, I'm a movie poster freak. But like uh, I like the artwork of movie posters, but I have this thing of le- ha- wanting to have an image to associate with the project I'm working on. It's like if I have something that I can look at and this this defines that project to me, like it keeps me going kind of. And I think it keeps people involved going. I mean, I always think that anyway. <laughs> so it's up, it's up there, uh, the poster. We went and we actually shot photographs. We took a specific poster. So that's our poster for incidents. I mean, it's yeah. unless we come up with another idea and decide to do like a style B, that's our style A one sheet poster and it's a pretty cool poster actually and it's mike on the front if you look at that picture yeah. it's mike walking away yeah. in the distance technically as a character from this first that's story right. that's going to be in the movie that's right. don't want to give too much away about the, what the movie's about but it's going to be another anthology it's four <clears throat> four stories we have a very loose idea for a tie together it's it's not even you couldn't even call it a wrap around this time it's kind of like a beginning and an end mm. so that there's something other than just the story starting you know what i mean so it doesn't look like a short film collection right. rather it's that a movie <laughs> of, right. from beginning to end and we're working on that uh but as of right now we're just in the planning stages uh when we're finished here tonight we're going to talk about working out rehearsal for yeah. the first story and uh, we i guess we're going to go the whole concept of it is, whereas we had, for, for You Better Watch Out, we had everything, everything was written and we cast the whole thing all at once. Yeah. And, but I, fi- but I figured since we're shooting separate individual stories that aren't particularly tied together, we can shoot them like short films and, you know, cast that story, shoot it, right? The next story, cast that story, shoot it. And when the whole thing's done, we'll put the whole thing together. Yeah. I think it'll be efficient that way because, you know, that was one of the things about You Better Watch Out is... We cast the whole movie, and then people had to wait. People in the last story had. And then we got a, we, we had a, we had a handful here and there who were like, "When am I filming? When yeah. am I filming?" And it, it's coming, it's coming, it's yeah. coming. So this way, people will get their story, and they won't have to wait too long. I think the longest wait out of the whole thing so far are like Bob and Lauren were going to be in the first story, like like uh, Bob Mendel and his wife Lauren Roy. Um, Roy. Right, yeah. Um, who are going to be in the first story that we shoot? Like the longest wait they've been waiting because we waited through the holidays. Yeah, because it just you know and nothing ever happens around Christmas yeah. time. Yeah, you it work just, retail, you don't get. I mean, we didn't even film our Christmas story for you. Better watch out at Christmas time. No, we didn't. <laughs> we filmed all. it in February, <laughs> which is good because it snowed. <laughs> yes, but um, okay. Uh, well, I guess I, I guess that's about it. I mean, I don't have anything else to add. You got anything else you want to add, Mike? No, uh, you've been I mean, talking. You've had the story, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I have, and it's been, uh, it's been great being on the show and reminiscing about cool. these awesome conventions. And Mike is is going to be my co-host from time to time on the show when when he's available because I know Mike works a lot, so it's sometimes it's hard to get Mike in here. But I kind of, I, I do want to get him. Like I, I kind of want to get you in here once a month at least, yeah, if, I, if, I like if you're it, cool yeah. with that. Yeah, this is awesome. definitely. And uh, we, our intention is to get more guests. We've got some. I've got some ideas on some people that we can get, some local people that we can start actually. You know, make a real show out of this. I think it's kind of cool. I don't know, and I, I enjoy doing this. It's really weird just to sit around and talk all the time. But I've, I've actually 
kind of grown a fondness to doing this and uh, yeah, uh, within five uh, episodes here I'm, I'm i'm appreciating it and enjoying it so it's fun so i hope somebody out there is listening to um so i guess that's it this is uh the end of episode five of uh video village the roadkill entertainment podcast um and uh if you want to check out any of the roadkill stuff like always you can go to uh www.jburn75.wix.com slash roadkill entertainment. It's like, it's yeah, like jburn.wix.com slash org slash this slash roadkill entertainment one, two, three, four dash one dash. No, no, it's jburn. jburn75.wix.com slash roadkill entertainment. One word. That's it. And you can get a handy link to that on the Facebook page for Roadkill Entertainment. Yes. And if you go to Facebook, you can like us on Facebook. I haven't attempted Twitter yet. I don't know if I'm going to. I just, I, I'm not a twit. <laughs> so, or maybe I am. But, um, so yeah, well, thanks, Mike, for being here. And uh, we had fun. And all right, we'll, uh, we'll be talking to you next time. Take care.